Hey listeners, this is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, the show about the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve them. I'm Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. I found today's episode really fun and expect that most subscribers will be interested in it, even if it's not directly related to their career. If you find the conversation entertaining or informative, think about forwarding it to someone with a strong view about the value of education in either direction so they can enjoy it as well. And just a quick reminder that if you're in Australia or the Netherlands and want to go to a local effective altruism conference this year, you'll need to apply to go soon at eaglobal.org. Here's Brian. Today, I'm speaking with Brian Kaplan. Brian is a professor of economics at George Mason University and a blogger for EconLog. He's the author of The Case Against Education, Why the Education System is a Waste of Time and Money, Selfish Reasons to Have More Kids, Why Being a Great Parent is Less Work and More Fun Than You Think, and The Myth of the Rational Voter, Why Democracies Choose Bad Policies. He's been published in more newspapers and magazines than I can be bothered to name. He earned his BA in economics from UC Berkeley and got a PhD in economics from Princeton, though I guess he's going to tell us that that doesn't matter too much. Uh, (laughs) Yes, no. (laughs) Will Will Wilkinson described him as playful, uh, ebullient, kind, sportingly argumentative, and dressed unfashionably for comfort. So thanks for coming on the podcast, Brian. Great to be here again. So we plan to talk about the implications of your work for listeners' career plans uh, and an essay you wrote a while back uh, about the risk of global totalitarianism. But first, what is the core argument that you make in the case against education? A core argument is that a lot of the payoff from education comes not from learning useful skills in school, but rather just from showing off, from convincing employers that you're worthwhile, basically jumping through hoops and getting lots of stickers on your forehead. And while, selfishly speaking, it doesn't really make very much difference why exactly your education pays, but from a social point of view or from an effective altruism point of view, it matters tremendously because if you go to school, if you are actually learning how to do new productive things, then your gain is society's gain. But if what you're doing is looking better than other people, then your gain is really the rest of society's loss. And essentially, I just go through the case for why it seems like so much of education is signaling and then try to recalculate what is the social return to education versus the selfish return once we have factored in this new theory of what the mechanism is. What well, alternate kind of, theory, not really new. Right, right. And so what are the top few pieces of supporting evidence for this uh, signaling theory of education? Yeah, so I mean, ultimately, I just start with the curriculum and just go back to all the classes you've taken and just ask yourself, when do you use this stuff in real life, if ever? And again, there's just so many courses where I think like almost everyone, when they aren't trying to defend a theory they are supposed to believe, they submit, yeah, I studied a ton of stuff that not only never happened to come up, but was foreseeably ultra unlikely to ever come up. And you know what? It didn't. You know, like trigonometry. All right, it's been a year studying trigonometry, and if you ever dare to raise your hand and say, when are we going to use this in real life, you get a sneer from the teacher, oh, you'll see. And I ask people, well, have you seen? How much <laughs> is real life really about trigonometry? And I'm like, yeah, I guess it's not at all for almost anybody. Right? So, I mean, just looking at the curriculum and just you know, going through it and just seeing how much of the coursework that you've done, just very foreseeably, you're never going to use again in real life. Looking at college majors also and just seeing how many of them seem to be tied to almost no job other than being a teacher of that very subject. So, again, that's, that's really where I start. Then there's a lot of just observations that people have from their time in school, things like it seems like you know, people are much more focused on getting good grades than actually learning anything. Right. So how many times have you deliberately sought out the easy A, the teacher who goes and will give you an A in exchange for doing no work and learning nothing? It seems like students are very interested in tracking those people down. Very unusual that someone says, yeah, you know, says I'll only take him if he teaches a ton of useful material. Right. Um, I mean, you know, so well, you know, like one you know, fun piece of support for this. So on the Rate My Professor website, at least in the past, they'd have a rating for easiness, but no rating for job relevance. Right? And it was like, wow, it seems like people seem a lot more interested in the easiness and the job relevance. You know, you know also, you know, like another primordial fact is that if you want to get the best education in the world for free, you can. Just say, suppose you think it's Princeton. Just move to Princeton and start attending classes unofficially. Don't enroll. Don't pay any money. And just start learning. And you'll see there's almost no effort made to prevent people from learning, the, getting a Princeton education for free. Unfortunately, just one little thing that you won't have at the end of four years, and that is, of course, you know, grades and diploma, right? So, and, and it seems like because of this, almost no one bothers to take advantage of this inc- of seemingly incredible opportunity. Uh, you know, and, and just another fact is the way that people forget so much of what they learn in school. 
And in fact, you often will forget so much that you would no longer be capable of even passing a class that you got an A in years ago. And yet employers regard failing and forgetting as two very different things. If you're being paid for the skills that you acquired, failing and forgetting are the same. But on the other hand, if you're getting paid for impressing people, then failing and forgetting are, are very different because almost everybody forgets. But if you, if you did well in a class and then forgot it, that says something about your willingness and ability to learn. And so it so convinces employers that you're, they should hire you. Uh, then I also go into four sub bodies of research, uh, all of which I say confirm the signaling model. And we could go into the, all those if you want. Hmm. So listeners won't be surprised to hear that uh, the case against education is a, is a bit controversial, uh, even among people who study education. That, I say especially, actually. Especially, yeah, right. Well, it's very <laughs> sacred for them. So um, if you were right, what, what would be the main implications for, for society? Uh, main implication for society is spend less on education. The idea that because education raises individual earnings, that it is a good social investment is just wrong, right? If I, if I am right, that idea that is so prevalent you know, there's the idea you just go and take a look and you see people with more education get better jobs. So if we all get more education, we all get better jobs, right? And the signaling model says, no, wrong. This is just an, a, a case like standing up at a concert to see better, which works fine for an individual, but is totally counterproductive for a society. So, I mean, essentially this means, you know, a totally new view on what, what is a good way to invest taxpayer dollars, Right, it's a, you know it's a totally new theory of economic development. And, you know, again, it's so popular in development to just pour money in education and then modernize. And signaling model says no, that's not a good way to modernize at all. Right, it's actually going to burn up a lot of useful tax dollars and time in what is really a, a mostly zero sum. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I say those are the big, big implications. I also talk about the value of vocational education and how you know you know I think there's you know good evidence that selfishly we actually underrate it. And again, especially uh, when, you know, for kids who really do not like school and are not likely to finish and are likely to end up in jail, vocational education is a lot better for them, selfishly speaking. But then from a social point of view, even more important because you know, vocational education, whatever else it does, whatever it does for private earnings, at least it's teaching tangible skills that people go out and use in the real world. Mm. Okay, so you've explained, or you've gone into a lot of detail uh, on, on, on the case in the book in various other interviews and in a whole lot of articles online. So uh, I'll, I'll stick up a link to uh, one of those. I think that the Econ Talk episode is perhaps, mm-hmm. perhaps the best source for people who are really interested in hearing kind of you, you describe the evidence uh, at length. So here, yeah, yeah, yeah. because I've only got you for so long, I was hoping to spend a bit more of the time on, on objections. Great. So in estimating the, the magnitude of signaling's uh, effects in education, you rely quite a bit on the sheepskin premium. Do, do you want to explain what, what that is for the listeners? Yeah, sure. All right, yes. Yeah. So sheepskin effect. In a pure human capital world, that is, you know, if the only reason why education raised your, uh, raised your earnings was that it raised your skills, then if you happen to be one class short of graduation, this should have only a very tiny effect upon your earnings because there's only a tiny difference in the amount that you know, whether you have all your classes for a degree or if you're one class short. On the other hand, if part of what you're doing with your education is signaling, and especially if one of the things you're signaling is conformity, that you're willing to just go along with social expectations, then there could actually be a discrete jump where finishing that last class could give you a very big payoff. Uh, so in the book, I, you know, I go over all the studies that I can find on this, and essentially every single one done in the last 25 years finds that there is a much bigger payoff for graduation from both high school and and the bachelor's degree than there is for the earlier years, right? And in the book I go and actually average out all the results, and I find that for high school, on average, again, this is only, almost all these are from the US, and one or two studies from Canada, but almost all the studies find that senior year is worth about as much as the first three years combined. And then for college, and that's in percentage terms, so it's even bigger than it seems. And then for college in percentage terms, it looks like finishing senior year is worth about twice as much as the first three years combined, which is, again, a, a very, very large difference. So that seems like pretty good evidence on, on its face that uh, mm-hmm. that signaling is, is a large fraction of what's going on. And, and I certainly don't disagree that signaling is an important function that education provides. Mm-hmm. But I can't help but feel that there's something not entirely convincing about that specific number that's generated mm-hmm. by just saying, well, well the mm-hmm. sheepskin effect is, is mm-hmm. signaling and, and, and the rest mostly isn't, or at least partially isn't. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So it seems like you end up comparing someone who kind of just graduates against someone who drops out just mm-hmm. before graduation to estimate mm-hmm. this like premium from that final year mm-hmm. or the, the, from, from mm-hmm. getting the piece of paper, which is uh, where, where the term sheepskin comes from, because originally mm-hmm. uh, diplomas yes. were printed on sheepskins. Yes, yes, um, yes. So uh, your, uh, your animal rights people may not be happy, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I have well, nothing to do with this. Not yeah. my fault. <laughs> usually, not, usually not printed on sheep anymore, I imagine. Yes, but yes. Two, two things that occur to me is... Won't the sample of people who drop out just before graduating be fairly small, uh, making kind of the estimate of, uh, you know, incomes of people who dropped out mm-hmm. at the last minute kind of an, an, an imprecise? And also, isn't kind of the, the group that drops out just before the final class or, you know, before starting their final year uh, kind of an odd group, right? Because mm-hmm. that they were so close to getting this enormous reward and mm-hmm. they decided not to. So possibly they got sick. Possibly there was like serious problems in their life that prevented them from graduating. Or or even if not, I mean, at that point, they're signaling that despite the enormous amount of money that they might expect to make by graduating, mm-hmm. they decided not to do it, which suggests perhaps a lack of conscientiousness or, or poor judgment on their right. part. And so perhaps yeah. that, that that's what employers are looking at when they say, well, you, you did three years, mm-hmm. really? And then you stopped? What is wrong with you? Uh, right. Although, hmm. so I guess you know, there's there's a few things that are getting you know, that are that are getting uh, you know, packaged together. So one thing is that you know as you might expect, you know people have tried putting in different controls for ability to see whether it's just that the abler people finish, and the and out of the studies that do this, usually what they find is that controlling for ability reduces both the graduation gain and the annual gain. And if, but if you but again if you think of the sheepskin effect as basically the ratio of those two. Then the ratio seems very stable, actually, to le- at least the big. You know, again, the you know the main ability control they actually use is uh, you know, measures of intelligence. Although that's also the main one that actually seems to make a difference when you're doing the estimate. So, I mean, again, you could you could back away and say, well, there's just some unmeasured thing that no one that we we just don't have any measure for, and that would destroy the result. And again, like honestly, like for all observational econometrics, you can never rule that out. You can, but I think I think it is fair to say that look, the main thing that we know works doesn't change the result at all. So, you know, the idea that this is that this is all artifactual, so, you know, really even primarily artifactual seems hard to believe. Now, again, like it seemed like you were actually sort of moving into a specific signaling story, which, you know, I mean, it actually makes sense, which is that, you know, what do employers think about someone who does three years and then gives up? And they think, my God, what's wrong with you that you would do this? Right. Although, again, I think that, that you know, this is just, you can just flip it around and they say when someone does graduate, they say, oh, look at what's right with this person. So... You know, like it's, it's, it seems that in terms of it just being quantitatively wrong, I don't see why that comparison is off. I mean, again, it's just sort of saying like how much of a difference do people see between the three year and the four year person in terms not of what they have of the skills they've acquired, but in terms of what kind of person that they are. Mm. So that is still a signaling story, but it's a signaling yeah. story in which the sheepskin effect perhaps exaggerates the impact of graduation relative to learning, I think, mm-hmm. because the, the group that's just short of graduating is, is peculiar ah. in this particular way. Okay. Okay. So, so now the other thing is that usually what I'm actually doing, because most studies don't actually give you return per year. They don't say freshman return, sophomore, you know, sophomore, junior, senior. Usually what they'll do is they'll give you a sheepskin and they'll give you annual. So we're not basing this comparison upon just graduators versus people who do three years. It's based upon graduators versus people who do, who, uh, do zero, one, zero, two, or three years. I see. And basically you're lumping the one, two, and three-year people all together into one category. So it's not, so again, it's not nearly as heavily selected. It's, there are a few papers that actually do exactly what you're talking about. And those actually find that every year has its own return. <laughs> So, you know, like every year is special. And again, senior year is still by far the most special. And then actually there's a paper or two that finds that freshman year is special. You know, know, it's like the second most important year. And basically this is, you think of this as the signal between someone who at least tries to do a year and someone who doesn't. Mm. I I thought that that could be bad, that that going to university for one year and then dropping out might look worse than someone who just tries to do something else and doesn't even like try and fail. (laughs) You know, so you know, at least in modern modern U.S., uh, I think the stigma against someone who doesn't even try college is pretty great. So that makes okay. sense to me. And the second year, so so, and it's and the third year then is the one that's normally found to be worthless. And again, I think that is you know you're right. That's a small number of people, maybe three percent of the population, something like that. But it's a small number of people that is operating under a very negative stigma where they do a whole extra year, and then employers are so baffled by this decision to give up that it seems that that third year pays zip. But again, normal, you know, again, like most studies don't actually break it down with that level of granularity. And so the comparisons that I'm reporting are essentially 
ones that compare people of one, two, or three years to people who, who actually finish. So it's not it's not so sensitive to just those people with exactly three years. I see. So you're saying you could look at the annual gain from doing the first, second, and third years and kind of average those yes. and then- Yeah, exactly. And, and, that, and that's what most people actually do. Okay, I mean, right. really, really what most people, you know, like if you want to get econometric about it, what most people do is the regression of earnings on years of years of education completed and degree completion. And you just have those two things separate. And so that means that, that in percentage terms, every, uh, every, one, every year is, is automatically the same. But then since we have a special variable for degree, then we can get a, a bonus or a bump. And of course, turns out for college especially, the bump seems to be almost the whole thing. Okay. Well, that would, that would deal pretty well with my, with my objection. Mm-hmm. I mean, do, do you find it surprising that these ability controls don't turn up anything peculiar about the people uh, dropping out in third year? Right. Well, let's see. I mean, you know, so the main thing to remember is just that we like you know, even today, strange as it seems, there aren't really good ability controls for non-cognitive ability. So, you know, like I mean, there's there's you know a lot of different pieces of evidence that employers really value some kind of character or attitude, but none of the measures of, ca- of character or attitude that that are commonly used seem to be very good at predicting anything. And this is one where you can no, either. What, what about the marshmallow test? I've heard that that one's predictive, but well, I wonder whether that hardly, really is. Hardly, hardly anyone's been given the marshmallow test. I see. Okay. So, so that's that's this can't really be commonly used. I mean, honestly, I actually for the book I did try tracking down studies that use the that supposedly use the marshmallow test for predicting income, and my memory is I couldn't actually find them. And like in the end, I'm like, is this like vaporware or what is this stuff? Yeah, I, I've, heard, I've heard that it's a bit of a myth, actually. Uh, but but yeah. I haven't looked into it very well. Yes, yeah, so, you know, so there's something there there's something being used for the marsh the, the marshmallow test being used for. But my memory, at least, I could be wrong, is that like I couldn't find a single study that actually used the marshmallow test to predict income. Yeah, I, I'll do a quick Google after this, and and we can put up a link to a study if we can find <laughs> yeah, it, or, or otherwise a debunking if it doesn't that's, exist. That's, you know, that's worthwhile. I mean, I had a graduate student who actually you know like a chapter in his in his dissertation with yet a very clever new measure of character. And what he did is he got a big data set, and then he used the percentage of, of, of questions that the respondent didn't answer as a measure of their conscientiousness mm. on the theory that a conscientious person fills out every single question, and, and, and then the lazy person just goes, yada, yada, yada. And he found that uh, this measure was quite predictive for some health measures and accidents and things. But then it still didn't work for income. So like, yeah, huh. I don't know. Like it seemed like it could have been. I mean, what was really neat about this uh, the, about this dissertation was that every data set can, can you can add a measure of empty uh, of uh, of non responses. Mm. So what he found is there is a secret measure of conscientiousness contained in every known data set, <laughs> and all you need to do is just re th- is revisualize what what it's saying instead of looking at non responses as lack of evidence, mm. treat it as evidence. Interesting. And so it was a really cool idea, which works for some stuff, but again, doesn't really work for what we're looking at, unfortunately. I mean, ultimately, I can't believe attitude and character aren't really important in the labor market, but no, no, no common measures, you know, like, like seems to be very good. And then I don't know what to make of that. But I was going to say, people who fill out a survey that doesn't really offer any advantage to them, maybe they're signaling that they're just like too compliant, or they're not independent <laughs> or rebellious enough, and maybe that's lowering their income. It's possible yes. it's picking up, uh, yeah, uh, mm-hmm. an ambiguously good uh, aspect of the character. Yeah, I mean, you know, well, so there's you could you could tell the story both ways. If if uh, employers find out about the people that do what they're told and then compete for those people, then they can make a lot of money. You know, just like you know, someone someone who is a back talker, you know, like you might think at the way like, uh, that this would lead them to get to do better, but then like, well, once people find out you're a back talker, maybe they just want to get rid of you. So. Yeah. So it sounds like you're, you're dissing the ability controls uh, that you kind of had to rely on mm-hmm. or you were, for, were forced to rely on in the book. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, mm-hmm. you're someone who's very admirable because you're, you're willing to mm-hmm. kind of venture out and, and, and say something about areas where the evidence isn't that good. Just make your best guess. Yeah. But uh, you right. know, is, is this is this one mm-hmm. possible area where uh, you could be getting the wrong result because the evidence isn't so great? Well, so it's you know it's possible. I mean, of course, this is getting you know, like if we could find the magic bullet measure of character or attitude that that does work. This was, of course, requ- this might require major rethinking of a ton of stuff. You know, like in all these cases, I would just say, you know, you got to work with what you got. So, I mean, it is true that, uh, you know, these intelligence controls do matter quite a bit. And then, you know, there's a few other controls that seem to matter, matter, matter marginally. My main answer to this is just that if the, you know, let's say like, you know, the intelligence controls, these are, this is the, these are the abilities where we know that there are other, other quicker ways of assessing them than just, edu- than just education. Whereas the character and ability, these are the things that are much more fakeable. Imagine you're going to an interview and someone says, here's how you get a good job. Pretend you're smart. 
It's like, wow, that's really helpful. I'll just pretend I'm smart. But on the other hand, if someone says, pretend you're hardworking, pretend that you're conformist. Pretend that you're friendly. Like, All right, that, that I can do. So, I mean, like, you know, so basically if the measures that are very observable, you know, even those do, you know, leave a very big effect of education, then it seems hard to believe that measures of things that are very fakeable, at least, at least over the short and medium term, would, would be much more potent. So sticking with the with the sheepskin premium, uh, you mm -hmm. did a debate a couple of months ago at the American mm -hmm. Enterprise Institute with uh, yes. Eric Hanishek, who's a, an education researcher uh, who uh, is generally well respected. Uh, and oh, yes. he, in, in his presentation, by, by, by me too, by yeah. me too. Yes. And, and he put up figures in his presentation for the sheepskin mm -hmm. premium, which suggested that it was a, a lot smaller than the estimates in your book. Mm -hmm. And I think your your response was just, uh, I'm a bit baffled by where where these numbers could be coming from. Uh, have you ha had a chance to to look into those and figure out why they why they differ from the numbers in your book and figure out which ones are more trustworthy? Yeah, so I've got a co-author who was helping me out on that actually. So Nathaniel Becker offer, who's a you know, PhD student at UC San Diego. And so, I mean, like, you know, there, there, there's one glaring problem with it, which is that Hanyshek's data set doesn't actually have years of college. So you can't really do a normal sheepskin effect. And then when I was inquiring, he, you know, like what he, what he did was just so different from what everyone else has done that it didn't seem very comparable. Uh, for high school, his numbers looked like they were just on the very low end of existing research. So, you know, like I'd be inclined to average the man. I mean, admittedly, like he, you know, like he, he does have an unusually large data set. So I'd be inclined to give, put more weight on it. So, but, you know, that, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's most, most, of what, most of what I can say about it. I haven't actually played with the numbers myself. I've been thinking of getting to it when I get through a queue of other things. I mean, I'd really like him to actually go and publish that result because the sheepskin effect, considering how big and robust it is, the number of actual publications and top journals people have gotten with it is uh, surprisingly small. It's one where, like, if you like, if you read this review article in, I think it's the Handbook of uh, the Economics of Education, you know, the uh, the authors who are very prestigious just say, well, it's well known that this is so big, and give, again, giving the idea that among econometric insiders, they've actually run a lot more regressions than have even been published. But I'm a little, you know, I mean, I'm just always concerned with what I think of as the autodidax curse, which is that you read a ton of stuff, but what if there's stuff that's known that isn't written? And, you know, I mean, I always try to reach out to people that are active researchers to see whether they will say, oh, by the way, Brian, these are some facts that are just, it's folk knowledge, but it's, re it's genuine. It's just no one ever managed to squeeze a publication out of it. So you don't find it in the journals. And, you know, there are quite a few facts like that, that uh, people will tell you if they're active researchers, like, well, it's just commonly known, but um, hmm, all right. Uh, well, you know, thanks. You know, you know I, I mean, I tried to go and collect as much of that as I could, but you know, there is always the problem that if you are not an active researcher in each subfield, people may just not tell you. So, right. So, if we took your estimates of the sheepskin effect from the book, mm -hmm. what uh, what fraction of um, the return from an undergraduate degree uh, looks like signaling then? Let's see. So, for the let's see, yeah, for the bachelor's degree, then it comes out at something like you know about sixty percent. Okay, so, yeah, so almost 60, almost two thirds. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. 60% for that. And you know, so the way that I use the sheepskin effect in the book is I have two different uh, you know, baseline uh, base estimates. So one I call the cautious view, one I call the reasonable. And the sheepskin effect is what I use for the cautious estimate. And then I have my the preferred reasonable one where the sheepskin effect doesn't play any special role. And that's where I just say, uh, based on a few other pieces of evidence, that 80% seems reasonable. And then we get, of course, an even lower social value to education. Yeah. But, you know, I think about the cautious one is the lowest a reasonable person will go for the signaling, and then the reasonable one is exactly where a reasonable person would go. <laughs> that's the name. Uh, so it seems like kind of an assumption in the book is that uh, as you move from primary school to high school to undergraduate degrees to postgraduate degrees, that that the signaling component is becoming larger. So kind of chopping off mm. uh, the, the later years of education is more effective than, than, than getting people to, to not go to primary school. Uh, is is that correct? And kind of do we have a sense of what the signaling component of, of you know, early years of education is? Right. So that's only correct on the cautious approach. So the cautious approach definitely backs you up. Uh, I mean, we like, I mean, I don't have anything for elementary school because, again, there's so little, there's so few Americans that wouldn't have done K through eight that we really can't measure that anymore. But yeah, but absolutely. Yeah. So what I get for... Uh, you know, for high school, I get something like, you know, like 37%, so a bit over a third. And then for uh, the you know, master's degree, something like, you know, close to like 75% uh, being signaling, use it using the using the one approach. 
again, you on the other approach, uh, I just set it at a flat 80% because I don't have, other than the sheepskin effect, I don't really have any particular evidence uh, that says that early earlier years are less signally than, than later years. And again, I will say that as a parent of four kids who have been in the K-12 through system, I very much inclines me to see tons of signaling there because there's so much of the day is spent on stuff that is so non-academic and you know, just, you know, just seems so unlikely to ever yield any, any actual career fruit. But again, you know, this is something where I can very easily see someone disagreeing with me. It just, you know, so, you know, so there are a few bodies of evidence that seem to back up more, more of just like 80% across the board. And we can talk about those if you're curious. I guess I was expecting that you'd say that, that it does get gradually worse uh, mm-hmm. but because if, if the signaling component is kind of constant across all years mm-hmm. of education and you think it implies that people should study a lot less, then it, 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 you could almost imagine that you're saying people shouldn't even bother going to primary school. If that's also 80% ah. signaling, maybe it wouldn't even be ah, worth the cost. Yeah, yeah. So, the, so, the, so actually, like, you know, if you really want to get into the math, the reason why I wind up getting higher returns for earlier years is just because completion rates are so much higher. Huh. So, I mean, like, the thing that's really bringing down the rate of return for higher education is the low completion rate. Right. And, and again, and of course, that's bringing down the selfish return as well as the social return. And then the earlier years, uh, you know, like K through eight, there's almost, almost, almost full completion. And then even for high school, um, you know, like people like James Heckman have put a lot of work into how bad our high school graduation rates are, but they're still awesome compared to college graduation rates. So that's re- that's that's really like you know, if you really crack open the spreadsheet and try to figure out what's go- what's what's going on, it's actually that completion rate that's crucial. But you can't really signal anything from finishing in primary school if everyone finishes it, right? In, in a sense, that's right. Of course, if you have a system where you're not even allowed to proceed to the next level until you finish the earlier level, then there's sort of this indirect signal of if you don't do that, then you don't get the later signal. So there's sort of a of a domino effect. I mean, there is something odd, I'll admit, about saying that second graders are signaling because it's like, well, no one knows what they did. <laughs> like, all right, well, okay, it's true that no employer has any idea what you're doing in second grade, but they look at what you did in college, and colleges look at what you did in high school, and high schools look at what you did in, in middle school, and middle schools look at what you did in elementary school. So there is actually this chain reaction, which, again, like you, and you can see parents being very, uh, being very cognizant of this chain reaction when they're desperately trying to get their kids into the honors classes in third grade because the way a lot of systems work is once you're in, you're in for life. So just get them in third grade and then they get to be in the good track forever, no matter what the performance is practically. Yeah, that, that makes some sense. I, I got to say, though, it kind of beggars belief for me <laughs> to, to say that the amount of actually useful information that you learn in primary school and in an undergraduate degree or a postgraduate degree is the same. Because it feels like in, in primary school, I learned things that I use every day. Uh, I learned, you know, how to write. I learned how to do basic maths. I learned my vocabulary. I learned basic social skills. It feels intuitively to me like you start out learning the useful stuff mm-hmm. and then they kind of run out of that. And so like in, in later years, it just becomes a larger and larger fraction of separating the smarter people from the less smart people. Right. Or again, like the, the more employable people. I like to think right. much more employable rather than smarter because there's so much that goes into that. Sure. So, you know, that, you know, that may be right. Although, I mean, the main thing that I would encourage you to do is to find out like what's actually being taught in American schools these days. And I think you might actually be kind of shocked at how unacademic you know, so much of it is. I mean, you know, like, I mean, think about, you know, like my older kids were in a school where they had three mandatory music classes. All were required. Everyone has to do mandatory, like, they had to do choir and dance and music appreciation, no exceptions. And like, wow, this is like burning up so much of the time. And like, let's just do music. And like, I mean, again, yes, you can say, well, they're learning some kind of social skills and music. And like, eh, you know, it doesn't <laughs> seem like that. Like, like, there's much going on there anyway. I mean, especially like, you know, like given this is a class where the kids are goofing off, especially, I mean, you know, like, so you may wonder, is it just teaching rebellion or making kids so resentful? But you know, I mean, I would just say that, I mean, here's the main, main thing is that's striking to me is I've had many people who are you know, professors who will say, well, I mean, of course, you're only talking about college, Brian, because we all know that K through 12, that stuff's all useful. And, I, and I'm just like, all useful. Like, do you remember at all what was done? Now, I know you're not <laughs> saying that, but there is this weird amnesia slash Stockholm syndrome that people seem to get where as long as it's on far enough back in time, then they fill in like useful stuff every minute of every day. Whereas when the kids are there, like, like it seems like it's a very different experience. And they're just like, why are you teaching us this? And why do we have to do this stuff? 
So it, it's possible that you remember the classes that were useful because they're the ones that are memorable. Yeah, yeah yes, yes. So you yeah. know, I mean, I think someone could fairly say, and Brian remembers the stuff that wasn't useful because that's the kind of person he is. <laughs> again, again, I do try to control, you know, to control the bias just by making a list of you know, like subdividing it. Like, so what were the classes that I did in tenth grade? And my my memory is actually shockingly good for some of this stuff. So I think I, I have almost a perfect memory for my high school curriculum anyway. Sometimes the te- I'm a little hazy on the name of the teacher. I still can remember the teacher. But just to go and pay attention to, you know, like you know, crack open your old transcript and just go through class by class. I think people will say, wow, I just forgot that I had to do all those classes. So uh, you say throughout the book that you, that you do think learning to read and write and do basic arithmetic uh, mm-hmm. is, is pretty valuable. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you think that we could get big economic gains from teaching those things properly in the earlier years of education and really, really focusing mm-hmm. on those completely? I mean, so I think we I think we get good economic gains. I don't you know, not great. And so I mean, this is part of my debate with Eric Henyashek. Henyashek does have this idea, which which he, and he does have some some work on it that I can explain if you're curious, saying that not only does the individual get it get a good payoff, but society gets a much better payoff than the individual, right? For you, for him, it's more math and science rather than literacy and numeracy. But same anyway, same basic idea. Uh, yeah, I mean, so I think that. Uh, you know, like you know, to me, it's kind of crazy that you're going and making kids who uh, you know who don't know how to read and write properly to take three music classes. You know, if I were the principal of that school, I would say like stop, stop all the, all this stuff. There are kids who can't read or write, so until they can read and write, we're not going to go and have them do this other stuff. And well, like you know, like and that's it. And like so, that would be my reaction if I were the the principal. And yeah, in terms of just improving like you know individual employability, I think there'd be good gains for that. You know, so again, I'm not, you know, again, like the Henyashek results implying many tens of trillions of dollars from just boosting these scores. That seems very hard to believe. But the idea that you could go and reduce, uh, or like, like you know, rather, you know, increase labor force participation of weak students by getting their literacy and numeracy up to employable levels, you know, that seems pretty, pretty plausible to me. You know, and and for, you know, for that, like for many other common sense improvements in the schools, my reaction is that. I don't trust them to just do what they do, do the right thing if you give them more money. I mean, just the fact that they are willing to set up a system where they'll teach four other classes that they don't really need to know before they've done their basic job tells me that they are not the kind of people that I really trust. What are the best arguments against your your view in your in your own view? Sure. So yeah, the, like you know the Hanyashek stuff. Since uh, since you asked, I mean, so you know Hanyashek has quite a bit of international work. Uh, which, you know, like using using very standard econometric methods says that if you can get a country's math and science scores up, there will be an enormous gain for the country over uh, as a whole, which is far beyond the gain for any one individual of getting this up. And it's some kind of like social multiplier story or something like that. And the numbers that he gets are so huge that like anyone in effective altruism ought to go and just look at them. If there's a 1% chance he's right. It's worth looking into. Because you know he's talking like tens of trillions of dollars of present value of, of, of uh, created. Again, to me, what's you know it's very hard to believe about this is that the typical job in the uh, in, even in the first world uses little math and almost no science. So I just don't see how there could be these incredible multiplier effects of teaching something that almost no job actually uses. And again, I think the better story is that the result is spurious, and he's really picking up a social multiplier from intelligence. And again, which is much harder to teach than just math and science. Math and science, you just put more into math and science. Uh, you have more time and more time on tasks. Making people genuinely smarter, on the other hand, much harder to do. Uh, you, know, you know, of course, there's a lot of there's a lot of classes that can raise your score in an IQ test, but it seems basically like teaching the test for the most part. So I'm just not so optimistic there. Let's see. And then, you know, again, you know, like honestly, just that Henyashek result on the sheepskin effect with a really low sheepskin effect that was uh, fairly disturbing to me. Again, just you know, like you know, a guy who's so you know, so good with the numbers and knows the data so well, coming up with a result that you know, you know, that at least for high school is very much in the lower bound of my, of all the other numbers, and it's a big data set. So that kind of uh, that, that bothered me a bit. Let's see. And then you know, I mean, I mean, I guess in terms of doing anything radical, just uh, you know, not exactly the precautionary principle, but just saying, look, uh, you're talking about moving far out of the range of the anything that we actually have evidence for, and so you shouldn't do that. Right, <laughs> right, and just saying across the river by filling the stones. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So you know, so I mean, I, you know, that's another one. Which, which again, I mean, I, I admit, you know, in terms of like the level of uncertainty, what would happen if things were very different from what they are? I mean, I just think that's that's a fair point. 
Um, meaning, and for me, like I say in the book, it all depends upon where what your starting point is. So your starting point is the status quo is justified unless you show a big problem with it. That gives you a very different starting point from, or you have a very different conclusion than if you say, you know, like you know, no government spending is justified unless you show that that's justified. So again, sort of like whatever you consider the benchmark is winds up having a big effect on the result. And again, the way I tried to write the book is just to be transparent about that and say these are the things where I don't think it really matters where your starting point is. And I say these are some other results where it matters very much. And here's my start, my starting point. So this is where I end up. But if you have a different one, you're going to end up with a different conclusion. So. After reading the book, I spent a bunch of time looking for rebuttals to your view, basically. Mm -hmm. And it does seem like there's a a lot of people who disagree with you, but I I couldn't find almost any very sophisticated (laughs) uh, (laughs) engagement with the the claims that you're making and the empirical evidence that you're delivering. I think one one thing that I do agree with is is what you were just saying, that it's a lot easier to make the case that we should stop increasing the amount of education or reduce Mm -hmm. it slightly than to embrace Mm -hmm. some of the more radical ideas that you have in the book. Mm -hmm. Because we Mm -hmm. we just can't say what would happen if you reduced average Mm -hmm. education by several years, because it's just such a large change. I mean, I I, I don't think it's such a large change to reduce education spending by 25%, something like that. There's plenty of countries that, that exist that do that. So, I mean, and just for the US to have the educational level of Switzerland, you know that's uh, that I don't that doesn't seem that weird to me, and you know like that would be a big fall. The the streets w- probably won't run red with blood. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think so. <laughs> I guess you could also just look at you know how much education do people have in the eighties or, or the seventies, and, yeah, and, and yeah. what did that look yeah, sure. like? Uh, yeah, so you just you know, like early seventies would be about a little bit less than two years, be about two years, a little less than what we have now. So yeah. If you reduced funding for education from the government, how much would that just reduce prices and not actually change the number of years mm-hmm. people study? Yeah, great question. So there's a whole literature on the effect of, of uh, government subsidies on educational attainment. And the way they're doing it, it should actually factor in the the price effect and the quantity effect altogether. So you know, that, that's really what I rely upon. So essentially, when someone says, uh, you know, uh, increasing government subsidies by $1,000 per student raises educational attainment by like fraction of people that finish college by one percentage point, that is actually already factoring in these effects you're talking about. So I mean, essentially, you know, so like if government spent, you know, like like subsidized by a thousand more, you'd expect that would raise price by something, but of course not a full thousand. Mm. And when and the result of that, and when someone says that that intervention goes and raises the fr- fraction that finished college by one percentage point, that's already including that. And so when I go and reverse that, that's essentially the same thing. So I mean, in terms of you know, like like how much would it fall? Then again, it's already factored in. I mean, it, it is true that when people are doing the thought experiment of then it wouldn't be affordable anymore, and that's it's a separate issue. Then it's better on those grounds, right? So it means that you know the price is going down, and then the quantity that's that's going, the quantity is going down. But at the same time, if you're someone that wants to get the education anyway, still cheaper. But uh, but yeah, I mean, like I mean, so the existing approach, I think, was already handling that. So uh, as I was saying, I was looking around for rebuttals, and actually the the, the best one I could, or the, or the best uh, objections I could find to, to the signaling view of education was from a 1999 paper by John Quiggan called uh, "Human Capital Theory and Education Policy in Australia." Perhaps that's a failure on my part, but it, but it certainly had some some interesting uh, objections. Yeah, so I that, don't I don't recall reading that one actually. Let's see, did I cite it? Uh, no, no. no uh, actually, John 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 sent it to me. So, ah, okay. Um, but but right, I think so what did he say? I think you'll be familiar with a lot of the ideas in there. So one is he says if the signal about learning is imperfect, then all else equal, students will underinvest in education since they're unable to provide a fully informative signal of their achievement to, to employers or their actual education to employers. If so, a correctly specified signaling model might predict underinvestment in, in human education. Does that, sound, does that sound plausible to you? It sounds like if you know how to do good economic modeling, you can get any results. Uh, but no, it does, not, it does not sound plausible to me at all that if some of the payoff from education is acquiring useful skills and some is impressing employers, that it turns out that that, that it's that it's, that it's socially optimal to get even more education than if it were all building skills. Well, I, mean, I think so, I think the idea is if yeah. if it's very important to be able to demonstrate the skills, but you can't do mm-hmm. that very well, then yes. people will tend to to not develop as many skills as they ought to, uh, but because they can't communicate what they've actually learned. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean that's a reason to develop fewer skills, although it's not a reason to develop, uh, you know, to, to actually spend less less time in school. So again, you might say that it's an incentive to focus on the most impressive things, regardless of the most useful things. And again, I guess so. But again, that hardly seems like much of a defense of the status quo. So now, I mean, so like, I mean, I I, mean, I was in a debate with uh, Miguel Orquiola of Colombia. So he's got a model which. I say is already implicitly in the book, although it's possible that he's the one who actually put it down on paper. And so in the book, I admit there is some social benefit to uh, signaling, namely to get a ranking. 
But then in the book, I say, but once you've got a ranking, then at that point, there's no marginal gain to raising the average level of education. And what he, and basically what he's got is you know, basically, you know, it's a model where there's some extra value in having the really good people in the, in the really hardest jobs. So in which case, you know, I mean, basically you've got a redistributive element of getting more education where you look better, but also there's an efficiency element where you're improving the match a bit. And essentially, like in his model, you can like always improve the match more and more. And so like as the level goes up, you're always getting closer and closer to that. Again, like that theoretically is possible, but it just seems so you know, unreal to me. Again, like, you know, even the idea that today we're getting a, you know, a more meritocratic match of people, of people in jobs than decades earlier. It's not at all clear to me that's true, at least if you at – at least tabling issues of discrimination that were around in the past that really have very little to do with education. Or, you know, like the idea that in 1970 we had a much, much less meritocratic system than we do now. It's like, like really? So it seems you know, so, like you know, set, setting aside the racial issues. Yes, 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 yeah. yes. Yeah, exactly. Or you know, or, or gender actually probably is and maybe the, the bigger one since it's so many more people. Mm. Okay, so uh, another objection that uh, Quiggin raised is pointing to these studies showing that when the number of years of compulsory education uh, has mm-hmm. increased in some countries, uh, you can look at the the people who who just uh, you know got the extra year of compulsory education right. and and the mm-hmm. ones who who didn't who just missed out because of their date of birth, mm-hmm. uh, and that seems to show he said a, a small but statistically significant you know gain in earnings. Mm-hmm. What do what do you think about that line of research? Yes, yeah, so you said this paper is nineteen ninety nine. Yeah, so that's interesting. So basically, since that paper was published. The use of these compulsory attendance measures to measure the true causal effect of education has exploded and has become probably the main way of doing it. And then in 2015, there was a, a critique in the AER of the entire literature saying that's almost all wrong. Oh, uh, why, why is that? Well, so specifically for the, you know, again, almost all the stuff is for the U.S. So the paper did cite a bunch of uh, ones from other, st- from other countries just finding that, that it didn't work in other countries. But for the U.S., basically the South was the least educated part of the country. And essentially, the, the, this, this paper said that if you just interact compulsory attendance with region, then everything, everything's fragile and all the main results go away. And I mean, again, now, now this is a case where normally I would say, well, that's just one paper and you shouldn't really rely upon that. But there is a general rule that the AER almost never publishes critiques of any kind. And to get a critique published in the AER, you normally have to get it past the people whose work is being destroyed. It has to be pretty devastating. Yes, it's yeah, so it's very hard to get these critiques published. So Tyler Cowen is a rule that like any time a critique's published in the AR, the critiques right. You know, he said this before this paper came out, but I was like, all right, so so there's that. Now the other thing is actually that you know even if the result had been solid, uh, there's a general issue about how granular you think the education signal is. So for example, suppose that there is one county in the U.S. that has a higher compulsory attendance or stricter compulsory attendance law than 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 all the other places. Now. Uh, you, you know, like if employers had very finely grained understanding of the education system, then they might say, oh, he's the kid who went to the Granada Hills High School District. And we all know that there they push the kids to do more. And so his degree doesn't mean as much. But again, I'd say in the real world, employers do not have anything like that fine grained thing. And at most they're going to say, well, he's from California. Or again, maybe they'll just sort of average it out for the whole country. So in terms of like how detailed the, uh, the measurements that employers are making are, I mean, I, I just don't think that employers are likely to be distinguishing between people in one in like in one particular area who were born before or after a given cut point in uh, in the schedule. So that to me is pretty implausible too. Now you know, and the you know, last thing worth pointing out is that I mean, this was actually an earlier problem with all this compulsory attendance work for the U.S. Is this is not one of these instrumental variables that immediately works. It's one where you actually have to add a bunch of control variables even to find the compulsory attendance laws raise attendance. You know, right. if you just sort of you just sort of look at the raw correlation, then there seems to be nothing. So it's one where you have to actually go and really squeeze the rock to get some blood out of it in the first place, which doesn't mean that it's wrong, but it is the kind of thing that is just suspicious to me. So again, like if there's an instrumental variable that just immediately works great, those are the kinds that I would put more weight on than one where Someone has to go and like really wor- uh, finesse everything just to get the basic result out of it. There's a lot of discretion in the specification that they're yeah, using. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so that. But anyway, again, so anything is you know the 2015 critique. That's one where I haven't seen anyone reply to it yet. Of course, there are lags. And you know, and, and of course, the people whose life's work has been destroyed or, or allegedly destroyed, they're never going to go and, and accede to it. But 
Uh, this actually, there is a pattern of these education instrumental variables catching on and becoming a big fad and then someone publishing a paper saying actually it's wrong. So there's a previous debunking of using season of birth, which used to be the really popular one. And then someone said, actually, you know, basically I think the first people to said, yeah, season of birth. Uh, well, you know, like we all know a priori that there'd be no pattern of season of birth based upon socioeconomic status or, or, or other stuff. And then someone come, come and came along and said, hmm, there is. <laughs> oh, uh, so rich people like to have babies in some one season more than others compared to other people. Like, yeah, hmm. I mean, uh, not obvious, but uh, still, it's the kind of thing that uh, you say, all right, well, I guess we maybe should have checked that a little bit more. I think the early people did some cursory checks, but later people really checked. And and I and essentially that they, people stopped doing that. So, yeah, in general, I'm pretty skeptical of instrumental variables techniques because it's mm-hmm. just so hard to, to validate that the conditions are met. Although the, the changing mm-hmm. compulsory years of education seemed like a relatively promising one. But I didn't mm-hmm. quite understand the, the objection. You were saying that uh, because southern state or different states have different levels yeah. of education to start with. But, but, but when you're doing this, aren't you just... Well, kept- well particularly because the change, the, the change in attendance, and, you know, basically the South, a bunch of things happened in the South during this period. It got a lot richer relative to the rest of the country. So the South used to be really poor compared to the rest of the U.S. And during this period, it did a lot better. And then it also raised education a lot. And then I think it also raised compulsory attendance a lot. And basically, this means is if you sort of separate the South out and you like put in this regional dummy, then you'll see it doesn't, it just seems to be that the South was improving during this time rather than that compulsory attendance was improving things during this time. Uh, so, you, um, so you've got a time trend on both of these things. and Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, and, and, the, and the South has its own special pattern which is good in all, in, all, in all respects, and that's what supposedly is throwing it off, which, again, you know, I mean, I'm not going to claim that I went and, uh, and you know, looked at the numbers myself. I'm just relying upon these guys. At the same time, you know, if the result had come out the other way, I think I would, I would be uh, at least a bit more circumspect because of this special stamp of authenticity, which is it's super hard to get critiques published in the AER, and the gatekeepers are the people whose life life's work is being, or is being destroyed. So, like, when you combine that, it's like, that seems pretty credible to me compared to a lot of other empirical work where it's really just your mafia that has your back and is going to try to push stuff through if it supports what they want. So, here's another objection from Quiggin. He points out that in in the signaling model, a student from a bad or poorly resourced system should be offered a higher wage than a student from a good Mm -hmm. system with the same measured Mm -hmm. level of performance, Mm -hmm. since the implied Mm -hmm. ability level of the first student is higher. Mm -hmm. Uh, And Mm -hmm. then he refers to two papers that say, in fact, the opposite is true. Mm -hmm. Uh, What do you think of that? Yeah, so again, there, there's the granularity issue again. Do employers know what your school district is? Um, now, there is a related result, which is very well known and quite strong, which is that there seems to be a higher rate of return to education for blacks than whites, which very much fits in with the signaling model. I didn't mention that in the book because – actually, I'm not even sure why I didn't mention it. Probably I just felt like I'd have to go and add like multiple big sections on. But again, admit, notice – it's much easier to tell if someone is black than that they come from a bad school district, which is one where a lot of employers might not really like what I'm going to go and look at the quality of everybody's school district before I decide who we're going to give an interview to. That this gets in the way of the, of the desire to put applications in the trash as quickly as possible. Uh, so I mean, on, the, on the other hand, if it, do, it do, really does look like the percentage increase in your earnings you get from another year of education is higher if you're black, which very much does fit with like I start off with a negative assumption, but then you do something that looks good. And, and actually, that's more impressive than if you were someone where I was expecting good things to, to good things all along. By the way, this is a result. This does not mean that blacks earn more than whites across the uh, across the board, because essentially this is one where uh, for black high school dropouts, they're doing way worse than white high school dropouts. But then they have this much steeper rate of growth for year of education. And then, roughly speaking, you sort of reach the point of equality at around 15 years of education. So yeah, if you're a black college graduate, then you do out earn white college graduates. At least, at least, at least, controlling for some other stuff. So, yeah, that's very interesting. Yes, yes, but, but again, you know, the, the granularity again, which, which again, like, like I know it, it does feel a bit like a cop out. I will say that there were a couple of papers that supported me that also seemed to me to be very vulnerable to this granularity critique, and I just didn't, I didn't talk about them and didn't cite them actually because my aunt, like when I was reading them, I said, suppose this came out the other way, would I still be citing it? And I say, no. Well, then I shouldn't – it wouldn't be honest for me to go and, and cite it as support for me given that the method would not have been convincing to me at all if it came out the other way. Right. So, you know, there's even like a, you know, a, you know, a journal of political economy paper that was pro-signaling that I, in the end I didn't cite because I just looked at it and I said, look, this isn't very convincing. And like, you know, like it does seem to, it did seem to hinge upon like whether employers knowing some very fine-grained details about your educational backgrounds, and, uh, which seemed pretty hard to believe. 
One of the main concerns I I had with your argument was that I thought that defunding education would be bad for low income students who, Mm -hmm. you know, are are, are quite capable. Mm -hmm. Uh, But you argue that in the long run, uh, it wouldn't be, which which is quite kind of intuitive. And and I'm not entirely sure Mm -hmm. that I'm convinced. So can you explain Mm -hmm. your argument there? Yeah. So the argument just begins with an observation. So when would you rather be a high school dropout looking for a job today or 1950? Right. And saying like, you know, so today there's a very high, harsh stigma against the high school dropout. So you're very limited. And then in 1950, there would have been a lot of good people that did not finish high school. And so the stigma would have, would have been a lot less. And we can see this in the kinds of jobs that you could get as a high school dropout back in those days. You know, like it would not have been impossible to be a secretary at a high school dropout in 1950, you know, far from it. And again, many other jobs that would be middle income jobs would have still been open to you. So what I say is when we're thinking about the effects on the disadvantaged, you shouldn't just think about how it might be worse for the really talented kid from a poor family. You should think about the average kid from a poor family. And that's one where I say at minimum it's just a lot more complicated because there's a big difference between changing the funding for one individual and changing the funding for a generation. Change the funding for one individual, then your intuition is totally fine. But if you change the funding for a whole generation, it it changes the meaning of the education itself. And means that you know that, that there are a lot of opportunities that the poor have lost in the modern economy that they can have back again. So that's that's the basic argument. And again, like underlying this is like all the research that I cite on credential inflation, the way that for one and the same job you now need more education than you used to. And even just thinking about the people today that from poor families or disadvantaged families that still don't have good credentials, and think you know how they you know, like in many ways they are worse off. You know, like, like uh, you know, they're at a competitive disadvantage that they wouldn't have been at uh, decades ago. This kind of has the perverse implication that it's good for education to not actually show people's ability because that's a mm. one way that rich people can distinguish themselves just by, mm. by yeah. I mean, is that what we should think that like that the more accurate education mm. is as, mm. a, as an indication of mm. how capable someone will be in, in a job that, that we should be unhappy about that? Well, I mean, so, you know, there, there's an equity and there's an efficiency part here. So if you think as I think is, you know, is very true that there are some jobs where you really want capable people on. So, you know, like you want capable people building the bridges. It's not pure redistribution that the, they get those jobs. They actually are saving lives by being good. Then, you know, like, you know, like by having a better way of locating those people, then that's a social gain and not just for the engineers, social gain for everyone who crosses bridges. Uh, but at the same time, it does mean that that the stigma against people that lack the credentials does get worse. So, you know, like, you know, if you think about like, you know, the late 19th century, there's a lot of very successful people who had virtually no formal education, right? And, you know, and in terms of like, like so like, who would you rather be, like, well, what system would you rather be in? If you are you know, a high ability person, then the modern system seems better, right? Because you, first of all, like things work better and you also get rewarded for your talent. On the other hand, if you're low ability, then it's a little bit less clear because like maybe things only work a little bit better. But at the same time, there's a harsh stigma, right? Now then sort of, you know, like the stereo you were kind of was talking about, you know, imagine one where all that your education said about you were that you had money and didn't say anything about your ability. In that case, there'd really be no reason for employers to worry about it, right? So, uh, you know, like you know, it, it would reduce the incentive just to go to, to, to go to school just to show off. There might still be a lot of incentive to go there to impress other rich people or mingle with other rich people. And again, if you think about it more, you realize, well, there's money in that too, Right. Uh, so in the book, I have a detailed section on the marital pass for education uh, where, you know, and, and, I, and honestly, when people ask, so is it really worth sending your kid to a fancy school? I'll say, well, I mean, is your kid ever going to get married? And he's like, well, probably. Well, then, yeah, then, then probably yes, because the fancy school puts them into the elite dating pool. And let's see, I think, it, was it you or someone else that was recently quoting Robin Hanson on this? I think it was, was you actually. Was it you that was quoting this? Yeah. So this is this great yes. quote from, that I actually got from your book, which is uh, don't- Ah, okay. Okay. So it's actually from Robin. And Robin, Robin himself said he got it from, from its folk wisdom. Yeah. It's a yeah. Don't, don't marry for money. A go where the rich people are and marry for love. Yeah. So you know, I think this is one of the best reasons to send your kid to an elite school. And there's one or two papers that actually do find this, that even though you're unlikely to find your spouse when you're at school, it just causes the social segregation where you get to be in the, in the elite dating pool. And you know, you say, well, like you know, the fact that the spouse has money doesn't mean they're going to be happy. It's like, well, oh, doesn't mean they're going to be sad. So, you know, that seems like a good thing, selfishly speaking. Although, of course, this is you know, effective altruists may deplore that people are deliberately are putting all this effort in just to meeting other rich people. But depending upon your view about whether you need to be an effective altruist every minute of every day, or whether it's just something that you do for the for your uh, for your ten percent uh, tithe or or what. 
Mm. Okay, uh, I'll put up a link to a to a meta analysis showing that one year of education raises measured IQ by one to five points. Uh, ah. What what do you think of that kind of line of research? Yeah, so main thing to understand is that that paper is not at all out of line with earlier work. So I so like you know that paper came out after my book was already in the can, but I relied upon an earlier meta analysis by Steve CC, where he oh he found you know a causal effect of one to three points rather than one to five. So. You know, assuming you know, there, there, there is a difference, but you know, again, it's, you know, it's a modest difference. So like, it's very well understood, actually, that there seems to be this causal effect of education on IQ scores. What's nice about the CC paper is that he – and after establishing that, it's very, that this result is very solid – and again, this is using like a bunch of different quasi-experimental methodologies. So it's not just doing the dumb thing. It's really trying to crack the nut of causality open. But then says you know, there are two big problems with, you know, with the interpretation of this. So one of them, uh, CC says, is that a lot of education is, in fact, just teaching the test. And you may say, you can't teach an IQ test. And it's like, yeah, well, that's what you might say if you've never taken an IQ test or you don't remember what the, what's on them. But, you know, there's a lot of IQ tests that have very factual information, like who wrote Hamlet, what's the longest river in Africa. Stuff like that appears on bona fide IQ tests, right? And so when you realize that, it's like, hmm. So, like, you know, just learning a bunch of rivers, lengths, and authors of books, does that make you genuinely smarter? It doesn't seem like it. I mean, it's something where all else equal, you think smart people would know more of these answers. And yet, if you were to go and pour on the effort to teach the stuff, you would think you probably you're just putting giving them extra factual information without really making them smarter. Right. And then uh, even for something like Raven's Progressive Matrices, where you're just working with geometric puzzles, kids in school do geometric puzzles. And in the book, I point out there's a big literature on practice effects. Practice works. In fact, when I when I got a chance to finally meet Steve CC, one of my, my favorite question to ask him is, is there any known test ever that people cannot improve at through practice? And you know, if you know anything about Steve Cece, he was one of the best read researchers in the history of research. He's just a voracious and incredible reader. He writes – one of his main products are these incredible meta-analyses and literature reviews. And when he thought about it for quite a while, he said, no. There is no known test that you cannot improve at through practice. Uh, so that is – anyway, so that's, that's one, of my, one of my main replies to this. The gains are real but hollow. Where you are improving the measurement, but not the thing that you are tr- that you are ultimately trying to measure, right? Uh, which again, you know, again, like you know, the the most obvious case about this is you know, I know a way to make everyone smarter than Einstein. Which is just give everyone the answer key. All right, so you know, like everyone knows that's ridiculous. And there's some sense that if you directly teach the test, that doesn't really, that doesn't really make you smarter either. Like in you know, the SAT prep classes make the country smarter. Like then you know, like that doesn't see a, again, they work. They raise scores, but they don't. You know, but they don't increase the thing that uh, you know. They don't increase like tr- like like, you know, like what we're thinking about with intelligence, which you know, the, you know, it's the kind of thing where it's a bit hard to define conclusively. My favorite definition is just learning ability, ability to learn stuff, right? And I, I just did an interview with a philosopher where he was the only person who asked. He asked me for a bunch of definitions, like define intelligence, define learning, and I'm like, hmm, um, all right. I mean, usually I just take definitions for granted, but I will talk about that. Anyway, and then the other the other issue with uh, you know in education raise, raising intelligence is the issue of fade out. So you know it's very well established that you can improve someone in things uh, like like uh, but then if they stop practicing, then they lo- at least lose a lot of the gain. Right now, I think that the uh, the Stuart Ritchie uh, lit review that you're talking about does at least say that it's trying to account for this fade out. But you know, like at least in the broader literature, it's definitely definitely a serious issue, and especially in the in the most famous experiments of trying to raise people's IQ scores, those have enormous fade outs. Then the last thing is that if a mid range of like, like like education causally raises your IQ by two or three percent by two or three points, uh, this would still mean that we're only we're only explaining like twenty percent of the effect of education on earnings. So it's still very like it still would leave an enormous puzzle. So we could basically, you know, essentially because there is a literature that tries to separately estimate the effect of intelligence or uh, IQ scores versus education on earnings. And these usually fi- say that a point of IQ raises earnings by about 1%. So even if we took you know, the, these estimates as total gospel and ignored all of the worries, it would still leave most of the payoff for education totally unexplained. So that's sort of my, my final point there. But again, I don't want to, I don't want to rule out that there's, that there's some, that there's some effect there. And again, especially for really extreme cases. So, you know, in the um, nonfiction graphic novel and immigration that I'm working on, I actually uh, did come up with with a way of trying to measure the effect of adoption of, of early adoption 
on, on, on from the third world on intelligence. So basically, if you get a kid from Mali and move him to Sweden at an early age, right? And essentially, I was able to go and take a few different literatures that were ignoring each other and snap them together to get a ballpark estimate. And there, there's you know an enormous and long run effect of IQ of growing up in Sweden rather than just being uh, just getting the average average life in Mali. Again, to me, that's the kind of thing where it's so dramatic, it would be crazy to think there wouldn't be a big gain on true intelligence. But, um, yeah, so, you know, I'm not saying this thing can't happen, but I think it's just has to be a lot more dramatic than just giving people a few more years of education to really turn, to really yield this, these great gains. But, yeah, the, the yeah. fact that you get these pretty significant uh, cultural effects on IQ tests and practice effects on IQ tests uh, mm-hmm. does seem to me to make it very difficult to do comparisons mm-hmm. across very different times and places mm-hmm. that, that they maybe work to compare intelligence between people mm-hmm. who grew up in the same place. But once you mm-hmm. or, or at yeah. the same time, but once you move beyond that, it becomes yeah. very hard to tell what's real and what's not. Mm-hmm. Okay, so a final objection is from a paper by Hanishek called uh, Do Better Schools Lead to More Growth? Cognitive Skills, mm-hmm. Economic Outcomes, and Causation, where the abstract uh, points out that cross-country growth regressions generate a close relationship between educational achievement and GDP growth that is remarkably stable across extensive sensitivity mm-hmm. analyses mm-hmm. of specification, time period, and country samples. Mm-hmm. What do you think of that kind of research? Yeah, so, I mean, two things. So one, like I said, is that, you know, like he does not have controls for intelligence. So, you know, I see it's much more plausible to think that uh, that, a, that a difference in national intelligence leads to very big differences because you use your intelligence every day. Every, you know, there's no such thing as a job that doesn't use intelligence. But there are a lot of jobs that don't use math and science, right? And certainly, like most jobs, I'd say just don't use any science, really. I mean, I don't think there's anything actual wrong with his numbers. It's just that he's got this omitted variable, which seems like a much more plausible explanation for the general pattern. And then there's a question, uh, you know, I just say it's, it's a lot easier to raise math and science scores than it is to, uh, to genuinely make people smarter. Uh, so that's that's my main my my main reaction to that. I did actually. So I do have a section of the book where I do where I talked about that, and uh, that was my main objection to what he's doing there. But the uh, better science scores overall, it's just hard to believe that there are these big effects just because it's so rarely used. Uh, you know, only a very tiny fraction of people who study science ever have a job involving science. Literacy and numeracy, it's easier to think that there are good payoffs because they're used frequently, but still, uh, you know, kind of like these magic multiplicative payoffs that he gets. That's what's harder to believe. Yep. Uh, so I'm a little surprised you didn't mention actually what I would say is the single most common complaint about the book. What, what's that? Uh, that I'm just a Philistine economist who doesn't realize the point of education is not to increase personal or national income or wealth or any or ever any of the economic effects. Rather, the point is to elevate the human personality and just to uh, to refine our tastes and uh, and you know, make us into intrinsically better human beings. And maybe it may, it may, maybe you're too much of a utilitarian to uh, care about that stuff. That, but, that's right. Yeah I'm, yeah, I'm too much of it. Like I actually think philistinism is kind of the correct view. Uh, so so we so, so we disagree about that. But in this case, it works in your favor. Ah, okay. And like you know, my main reply to those people is, come on, at least read the table of contents before you say it. I'll talk about it. I've got a whole <laughs> chapter on this stuff. The other thing is they really do want to just give the school system credit for good intentions because they don't even really show that the school system successfully changes or taste or preferences or anything else. And you know, and I actually go and look at the data and try to see well, like. What evidence is there that people's preferences are being transformed away from Philistinism? And there just isn't much sign that it's really happening. So, well, you know, I mean, it does seem to me that a lot of people just want to give the schools credit for what they say they're trying to do rather than what they accomplish, which I think almost any effective altruist should agree is a crummy way of giving, giving an institution credit for anything. Yeah, I, I found your chapter on that pretty persuasive, almost I mean, I'm not too worried about whether people, you know, love the opera, but uh, you persuaded me pretty much that education isn't making people like the opera, even, <laughs> even if that was its goal. Yeah. Oh, one thing that was really quite remarkable that I was very surprised by uh, was the finding that number of years of education doesn't change their political views very much, doesn't make them more mm-hmm. liberal or left wing. Mm-hmm. I, I, mm-hmm. That, I almost can't believe that because it's so counterintuitive. Right. So that's one where it's important to distinguish between overall liberalism and conservatism versus issue specific views. And that's what I do in that section. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I mean, but so I mean, one thing to know is this is averaging over decades of data. So it may be that the world is changing. It could be that it used to be that education made people more conservative and now makes them makes them more liberal, and we're averaging out these effects. Although it should also make you wonder about what the effect in the future will be, because if it's changed once, maybe it could change again. Uh, so there's that. But you know, the other thing is, if you go and break it down by views on issues, then you do see these effects on it, uh, effects of education on, on specific issue views. In particular, it does seem that. More years of education makes people more socially liberal and economically conservative. You would like right? that, wouldn't you? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually, actually, actually. So to me, that's you know that sounds good, and that fits in with my earlier book, The Myth of Rational Voter, where I find a lot of stuff consistent with that. 
but you know, but like that that pattern is itself and is by itself so odd because there's so few college professors who want to cause that. Again, you know, I want to cause that, but there are very few professors on campus that want to cause a combination of more social liberalism and more economic conservatism, which then does make you start wondering, well, what is the mechanism that's by the, that is driving this if it's not the professors enlightening slash brainwashing the students? And that's where I say the best story is probably pure effects. And then I go on to this general issue of, well, if school does change people via peer effects, then the social effect and the private effect are very different, right? Um, when I, get, I think about the last election where you might say, well, college graduates are way less likely to vote for Trump. That's good. It's like, yeah, but maybe that's because all the people that would be disinclined to like Trump all hang out together physically in college and socially outside of college. And they have basically socially segregated themselves from all the other people. And now they no longer influence those people. And those people then influence each other in a pro-Trump direction. So the net effect is actually quite unclear. I mean, you know, like, like think about this as a philanthropist. Suppose you wanted to go and promote effective altruism. Would you want to go and create one special school of effective altruism where you draw all the best EA people together in one department? And it's like, hmm, well, if we did that, then this would mean that nowhere else had, a, had any EA people around to go and, and, and talk about and introduce people to the ideas. And maybe actually it would be bad for effective altruism to concentrate them all in a place where you could get an awesome peer effect there. But you've destroyed the effect of the voices, of like, 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 like the access to effective altruism everywhere, everywhere else. So, you know, and to me, at least, this, this is an interesting question about whether there's value in this. And I can see scenarios where there is a value to concentrating people, but a minimum is just not at all clear that it's worthwhile at all to do that. And maybe what you want to do is spread your, it's basically, you know, so put, a, put a little bit of your ideas everywhere. Maybe that's the best thing to help your ideas. Hmm. Just returning to the cross-country growth regressions, isn't it possible that although most people don't use their maths and science education, you know, a small number of geniuses do, mm. and they manage to drive up the, the country growth rate a lot through kind of the innovations that they create and that everyone else copies? Mm. Yeah, yeah, so, you know, that, that, that story makes a lot more sense. Of course, I mean, like, Kanyashek is almost always just looking at, like, the average, average results. I think he does have a few specifications where he sort of looks at, like, 90th percentile and median. Right, and then he winds up saying that each uh, each is important. So yeah, I think yeah, I think that is probably one of the one of the better ways of saving it. Although here's the thing: is that even out of people who have degrees in STEM, most of them don't use STEM. It's very extreme. The share of people that ever use this stuff, it's not the top ten percent. It's maybe not even the top one percent. So there was a you know U.S. Census thing that just looked at what kinds of jobs do STEM graduates have, and I think the result was that only about twenty percent of STEM graduates even have STEM jobs. Engineers, about half of engineers have engineering jobs, but still you really are going and slicing the salami ever, ever thinner. So I guess I can, you can imagine that going and having really good science for like the 0.1% of really innovative people is important, but then the, uh, using this as a justification for the system we have seems really odd. It might be a justification for like an Indian Institute of Technology system where you have really well-funded schools for the very best of the best, but again, that's not what the system that we have is, is about at all. So, you know, it seems like a really crummy defense of the status quo, if that's the right story. Okay, so let's push on to talking about personal implications from your research. Mm -hmm. So the first one that jumps out at me is that a lot of people try to learn generic skills or they try to mm -hmm. get better at, you know, things that they might do in future in an indirect way. You know, a classic one is that, you know, parents teach their children to play a musical instrument, hoping that this mm -hmm. will make them generally smarter. Uh, but, <laughs> but another one might be that, you know, people, uh, they just do writing in general, uh, hoping that this will make them better at their, at their jobs. Um, what's your view of that kind of uh, indirect training? Right. So, like in terms of what is, I mean, are you asking what is you know selfishly best for you, or what is socially best for you to do? Yeah, I'm thinking. So now we're talking to the listeners, and we're hoping to mm -hmm. give them some advice on how they can actually do better in their lives. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. But selfishly speaking. Selfishly not, speaking. Not, yeah. 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 So, right. So I mean, you know, like, like honestly, where I always start is gaming the system. I don't start with learning because the, the system doesn't seem very interested in learning. I would just start with, right? So like, well, what what do you want to do, and how can you do that with the least suffering to yourself? Uh, so, um, you know, basically, just like like sort of like going through the inventory and, and finding out which things you can cut corners on and which things you can't cut corners on. So again, you know, like you know, some obvious things are if it's way outside of your major, if you're just doing it for requirement, then just find the easiest person. Right, just you know, like so. Again, most Americans will never use a foreign language on the job, so if you can just figure out a way of find the easiest foreign language teachers that are around, go and do that. Like for college, actually, for most people, my advice is just be an econ major because 
Uh, I mean, I, my, I, I often tell my students, economics is the highest paid of all the easy majors, <laughs> right? And and there's a lot of this revolt, like, easy, it's not easy. I'm like, come on, people. It's not computer science. It's not engineering. You know, you can get, you can do really well in an econ major and still have a great social life in college. It doesn't mean that you'll, that you'll be like, like vitamin D deprived as you would be if you were a CS major. And again, so like, you know, economics is not the highest paid major. But it's not that far from the winners. So, you know, like winners usually electrical engineering, computer science, mechanical engineering, finance, then econ. But it's, you know, it's, it's not that big of a difference. So, like, a lot of it, as I say, like, you, have, you know, like, you know, major in econ because it is the highest paid of all the easy majors. So do that. And, you know, and, like, and then I say, like, well, whatever else you're interested in, you can do that, too. But, like, the econ- economics major will just get you a better job and open more doors for you. So I advise people to do that. Let's see. In terms of other numbers, so you know, general result. This is not primarily me. I'm just I'm just reporting what the researchers find. Your major is more important than the selectivity of your school. Better to go to a state school and be an engineering major than to go to Harvard and be and be a literature major for most purposes, at least for your career purposes. Maybe not for dating purposes, uh, but uh, or marriage purposes. But at least in terms of your career, it seems like this. You know, like like a hard major at a state at a, at a low, cheap state school. Better deal than going to a private school. Uh, let's see. Then I've also got stuff on is you know is it worth going to an expensive private school? And again, like the like the marriage, I mean, like like improving your, your marital options. Uh, that seems like the best argument for. In terms of just your uh, your narrow career, what I'd say what what I wind up saying is unless they're giving you a lot of scholarship money, probably don't go. Or like you know the only other reason I would consider going to a top school is if you have a spe- a special career that's even snobbier than other careers, like say professor. And if that that if your career goal is to be a professor, then I'd encourage you to go to a to a top school because graduate schools are super snobby, and then schools hiring professors are super snobby. So even though it may not affect your earnings, it may affect whether you're allowed to enter into your desired occupation at all. So I think about that. And then I guess like the other big thing to think about, this probably won't matter very much for your listeners specifically, but uh, maybe for their kids is. You should think about whether it's worth going to college at all. And I say there the main underappreciated variable is just completion probability. And there we've got this classic saying of the best predictor of future performance is past performance. So like, like best predictor whether you're going to do whether you're going to graduate college is whether you did well in high school. So again, I say like if you struggle to get through high school or if you know someone who's, who's struggling to get through high school, that's those are the people where it is not at all clear that it's a good idea for them to go to college, even selfishly speaking, because they're so unlikely to actually get that big bag of gold over the finish line. Yeah. W- Raising this issue of people who are unlikely to finish, it seems like the very most low-hanging fruit here is to convince people who are losing out personally because they go to college mm-hmm. for a year yeah. or two and spend a bunch of money and time mm-hmm. but yep. are very unlikely to ever actually graduate mm-hmm. just to convince them to stop going to university. I mean, that, that's something that maybe you could even get the government on, on board with or, you know, you don't, you don't have to tell anyone mm-hmm. to, like, sacrifice yeah. for the greater good. You right. just got to tell true. them, well, you're going to lose yourself. Mm-hmm. Yes. I mean, funny thing is the government used to have a whole program to go and do this. It was called Guidance Counselors. Right. And so back in the old days, a guidance counselor would bring you in and they'd say, you know, you are or are not college material. And this was hard to hear. But in the old, you know, and of course, sometimes they made mistakes. Sometimes there's someone who's really good and they told them they're not college material and they're late bloomers. But, you know, you know better than to put too much weight on that scenario. There's also a lot of people that were told not to go and they would have failed and they didn't go. And so they didn't fail. Right. And there was, you know, there's been a big change in the United States towards the college for all model. And now, and I think you, like, one of the one of the best ways to get fired as a high school guidance counselor is to start using throwing around that phrase, you're not college material. And you know, I think this is the kind of thing that will get big complaints from parents. Like, do you know what like, your guidance counselor so called told my kid said he's not college material. Right. And, you know, so meaning like you know, the government used to do this. Now, it, it, like it, there's more of whether you tell them to go to community college or four-year college is sort of the main division right now. And either you say, well, of course, college is for everyone. Everyone's college material, but you may want to, you should probably go to community college to get your grades up and, and that kind of thing. So, and then go and tell them about how great community college is for those who do well in it without ever giving them any idea about whether they're statistically likely to do well. But yeah, I mean, in terms of what I'm trying to do, I, I do actually try to give this advice. I mean, like, honestly, I don't think that kids that are struggling in high school are going to be listening to anything I say. So I, so I do try to direct this to the parents who I think are the, they're sort of the last line of defense of the people that won't get fired from their job as parents if they level <laughs> with their kid. So again, but, but you know, it's really hard and especially parents' pride is at stake. And this is where I, I think my best appeal is, look, what's more important, your, kid, your, your kid's future or your friend's, or your friend's uh, like, like pity? 
right? And, you know, you know, like, oh my God, your kid didn't isn't going to high school, isn't going to college. That's so terrible. Oh my God, right? And you know, I mean, I, I I know parents. I think their their pride is so strong they'd rather send their kid on this in you know this academic suicide mission <laughs> rather than uh, rather rather than endure the pity of their friends, but. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of parents who have mixed motives, and I just like to go and give them some moral support for advice to kids to go and try something else. And again, you know, I mean, like I try to frame it more positively as: can you find something else your kid likes and is good at other than academics, right? And you know, like, like, can you do that? Have you tried? Why not try? You know, like if your kid just really doesn't like school, why you know, like like why keep assuming they're going to turn over a new leaf and blossom in college, rather than say, here's ten jobs that are that give you a good life and don't require college. So as you say, probably most listeners to this show aren't trying to decide whether to do an undergraduate degree or not, but many of them mm-hmm. are trying to decide whether to, to, to go to grad school. Uh, mm-hmm. So what advice do you have on that for you know, students who did well in undergrad and they're, and they're considering mm-hmm. you know, doing an economics PhD or some other PhD? Who should do it and who shouldn't? And what courses should they consider and what courses shouldn't they consider? Yeah, that's, uh, yes, that's a great question. So again, you know, just, just to preface, data on graduate uh, graduate education is much smarter than, than data on high school or college. So here I'm just building on a much shakier ground, and I just think everyone should know that I'm doing that. Uh, but you know, I guess the main thing, main thing to know is that grad school completion is even lower than, than uh, regular college graduation. So, and remember that people go to grad school are generally well above average for college, for undergraduate. And so when you're thinking about whether to go, again, like the, the best predictor is, well, like how good were you as an undergraduate? So if you were doing very well as an undergraduate, then probably you'll be about average for grad school. And then remember, average doesn't do that well. So were, were you stellar for an undergraduate? Those, those are the people where they're likely to actually gain from graduate education. And then furthermore, you need to, need to consider what, you know, what you're majoring in. So there, I'm not sure that I found a single paper that actually measured the payoff for graduate programs as a function of major. It certainly seems like that, like the pattern for undergraduate holds very uh, holds up for graduate as well, with you know like CS and engineering and economics paying well, and you know history and philosophy and fine arts paying poorly. Uh, so there's that. Uh, so but anyway, so like like I factor that in, factor that in, and then again, as usual, like like if you know what occupation you're training for, then just see what is what is the job market for that occupation actually look like. So again, uh, there are many graduate programs where almost the only thing you do with it is to become a professor of that subject, or you just don't use it, right? So in that case, I, I would say, look, look, well, you want to be an English professor, look at look at the job prospects for people that are currently coming out with English PhDs and see how they're doing. And again, you know, don't ask yourself, are you as good as those people? Ask what someone who didn't know, who only knew what you were like on paper would think about whether you're better than those people. Because the world doesn't, you know, like, we, we don't even need to go and get into overconfidence and self-serving bias. But let, let's just say the world's not fair. And even if you're awesome, you uh, the world rewards being awesome on paper, not intrinsic awesomeness. And just, accept, you know, just accept this as a flaw in the world. And then consider that when you're deciding whether or not you want to try what you're, what you're going to do. And another sort of you know, general piece of advice that I've offered people is if you, you, know, if you want to do almost anything, anything in social science and a lot of humanities – and you are dismayed by the crummy job prospects of people that major in the subjects, then my, my question, right, so can you do math? And then if so, why not just go and get an econ PhD and then call what you're doing economics of X? And like, you know, I'm not even being flippant here. So like, I am baffled by people who like history and can do math who do a history PhD. Why not just do econ and be, be an economic historian? I mean, it is literally true that you will probably have tenure as an economist before you would have your first assistant professor job as an historian like that's how the world works and then once you have that tenure you can work on anything you want if you get if you never get another raise in your whole career you still probably have a better income stream than an historian would so this is of course selfishly speaking this is the kind of strategy if everybody did it wouldn't work anymore but everybody's not going to do it are they rob so, <laughs> so why don't why don't you go and do it yeah. well listeners we've got the special tricks for you there um yeah. just hope, and, and, just hope and, not and, too many of you do it yeah, economic philosophy, of course. Like you could either go and become a try to become a philosophy PhD, or you know, get or you could be a philosophy professor, or you could go at economics and then do economic philosophy. Probably get tenure before you would get your first job as a philosophy prof, and then you know, like yes, yes, you'll have to go and do some stuff you don't like to, to get tenure, probably. But then afterwards, it's clear sailing. So why not? It's a shame that the evidence on postgraduate courses uh, isn't better. Uh- I recall one thing you said was that master's degrees don't tend to do very well. Is that mm-hmm. right? 
Um, yes. So, so again, of course, you know, they still do have higher earnings, but when you basically when we combine the low completion probability with the modest gain and the high opportunity cost, because you know the opportunity cost of high school is really low, right? Basically, it's like a high school dropout wage. But the further along you go, the more the bigger your opportunity cost is. And also, like, like you're starting to cut off some of like your peak earning years too, and th- and this is what winds winds up giving the giving the bad result. But again, I'm not going to say that the master's degree data is, is is any good either. Like it's it's very sparse. And again, like you know, in a way, this is uh, the good news is that people are studying the decision or are putting more time into studying decisions the more people face. So I suppose that's good. But at the same time, given the sheer volume, you'd think that there would be 20 good papers on it, and it's you know, very hard to find anything that was I really thought was was compelling. I just wanted to return to the issue of transfer learning, which I tried baiting you ah, with yes. earlier. Ah, yes. So this is a, this is I love the subject because background. If you go, if you get a uh, PhD in economics as I did, you will hear the word the word psychology and psychologist said many times with as much contempt as a human being can muster. So, oh, well, that's what they say over in the psychology department. Oh, well, why don't you just go be a psychologist? And you know, like, like economists just love saying these words with ultra contempt. And of course, yes, this does reflect their real disdain for the field. And yet, when you start going and telling economists, like, well, look, how can human capital being be, be built by all these classes when it seems like the coursework is totally unrelated to the job? And then suddenly the economists say, oh, well, uh, you know, like basic psychology here. I mean, like, like you learn one thing, you learn, you learn other things, learning how to learn, critical thinking. And basically they then suddenly reference a bunch of things economists never study. And who are the people studying them? They're psychologists. So suddenly they respect the field, although not enough, of course, to actually investigate what they found. I mean, I, I will honestly say I have enormous respect for psychology when economists get all delighted by the replication crisis in psychology. Like, yeah, you're going and finding some problems in problem papers, but they're outliers and there's a lot of genuine knowledge that is still not seeped in. And you're just deliberately going and searching for this is like, you know, this is lemon picking rather than cherry picking, finding the worst of the bunch and then saying, aha, we're justified in our contempt. Economics papers don't, don't replicate at any higher rate anyway, but sorry, go on. <laughs> I've heard that's disputed, actually. Oh, but interesting. I, okay. Yeah, yeah, but I, but I, I mean, again, like though an economist, I'm kind of, I'm kind of inclined to believe you're right, actually. But, but there's I, a lot I mean, of heard... dodgy stuff in econometrics, and like, yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, in, a lot of instrumental variables right. papers just not relevant. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, sorry, go on. Right, right. So yeah, so so any, anyway, I mean, I've got a lot of respect for psychology. I mean, I, I love talking to them and I love reading them. And you know, I, I honestly, I'd rather read one more empirical psych paper than another empirical econ paper. I feel like I learn a lot more out of it. And again, like they're, they're just addressing some a lot of bigger issues that are relevant to economics, and rel- but economists don't know about it or don't care. But anyway, so in writing this book, I tried to go and read everything I could find that uh, that psychologists have come up with on learning how to learn, learning how to think, critical thinking, like all of this whole general area uh, where you justify studying studying X because it improves Y, studying something that you plainly don't use because it's allegedly going to improve your skills and things that you will, in fact, use. You know, so anyway, I found out con- uh, educational psychologists have been studying these issues for about 100 years. And overall, they're ultra pessimistic. And again, like, you know, to me, this is, uh, the reason why I, I, I think this is especially trustworthy is these are the kind of people that very much seem like they wanted to find the opposite result. They really wanted to find that learning how to learn was huge. And in fact, they'll often, when they give their, their, their life stories, their autobiographies, they'll start off by saying, well, at first I thought that there must be a lot of learning how to learn. It just hadn't been studied properly. But after 20 or 30 years of nothing, I've changed my mind. And then like, I wish, I wish it were otherwise. So you know, out of people specialize in this, they're generally very pessimistic about learning how to learn. Their general view is that teaching someone X at best teaches them X. And if you want to teach them some other thing, some other skill, focus on teaching them that thing. So you don't teach writing skills very well by teaching history. If you want to teach them writing, teach writing, right? And you know, even there, of course, they're kind of pessimistic because um, you know people forget so much, and also you know, like like what people learn, they just tend to compartmentalize it so much. But still, this is this is their general result. And then in the book, I talk about the main exceptions to these rules. But you know, first I just talk about the main evidence. So there's a lot of experimental evidence where people are just really bad at taking one lesson and applying it to a logically relevant lesson, right? And when you first read the experiments, um, you, know, you might be inclined to say, well, it's because the questions are too hard. So if you were to go and teach them A, and then you need to go and do a 17-step proof to see why it's relevant to question B, and people don't do that, then it's like, well, yeah, of course people don't do that. That's really hard. 
But the neat experiments are the ones where they contrast teach A, see how well they do on B, with teach A and give them the instruction, use A to solve problem B. All right, and then you'll see that people improve a lot. So it's not that it's so hard to see the connection. It's just that even when the connection is seemingly very obvious, people just don't tend to think of the world as connected in this way. And so they tend to treat every problem as compartmentalized unless you're told. And then, of course, in, the, in real life, you're not being told. There isn't, any, there isn't a concierge on your shoulder saying, now, Brian, now reference what happened to you in 10th grade Spanish to convince Rob that transfer of learning is a myth. All right, like that's that's not how the world is so constructed. Like so, that to me is is pretty compelling. And then, you know, there are some counterexamples which I do try to cover. So again, it's not that there is no such thing as transfer that never happens, but it's just so much smaller and more meager and disappointing and just more fragile than what economists assume and what psycho and what psychologists hoped. Yeah. I got to say, this confirms all of my biases because I always thought the idea that, like, you know, learning a musical instrument was going to make you better at maths yeah. just struck me as total nonsense. And and it seemed like mm-hmm. you'd get that illusion because people mm-hmm. who are just more intelligent are going to be better at music, and then they'll also be better at maths. And mm-hmm. and unless you like figure out some perfect way of controlling for that, it's always going to look as mm-hmm. though these things are going together, and you're getting yeah. lots of transfer, mm-hmm. but but you're not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so the first the first guy who got got really into this was a psychologist named Thorndike. And he specifically targeted the teaching of Latin as this incredible builder of mental muscles. <laughs> and I mean, so, <laughs> right, well, I mean, it was funny because, of course, Latin was taught for about you know, maybe a thousand years after it fell out of use because you needed it to be a churchman. All right. So it was taught as basically being part of the Catholic Church. All right. But then, of course, the Protestant Reformation comes. You don't need Latin anymore for that. And then do people abandon the teaching of Latin? No, they come up with a new rationalization for why you have to have to teach Latin. And it is this mental muscle story, which which lasts for hundreds of years with no experimental evidence of any kind. And then Thorndike comes up with some of the earliest experiments and finds, no, it does not teach mental muscles. And now, like, like now basically people are at the level of just learning Latin, even improve your, uh, your, your, the acquisition of other Romance languages. So they narrow it down to something where it's totally plausible that Latin would be helpful. And even there, actually, they come up with decidedly mixed results because while studying Latin improves your acquisition of French and Italian vocabulary, it seems to actually hurt your acquisition of uh, of French and Spanish grammar because the Latin grammar is different. So you get what psychologists call interference, where uh, learning two bodies of information that conflict with each other, actually the the initial learning hinders your ability to acquire the second thing because you've got to basically unlearn or maintain two different mental books in your head. It just makes me so mad. If you want to learn French, <laughs> learn French. I mean, maybe that's not even sensible, but the idea of learning Latin just to like learn French a little bit faster seems yeah. absolutely <laughs> farcical to me. Anyway. Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, I well, mean, in the, in the US, I've heard so many times I learned Latin and it really improved my score on the SAT because of, the, of all the Latin roots of, of English vocabulary words. Like, how about learn some English vocabulary words? Wouldn't that be a little easier? I'm just, I'm pulling out my hair here. Well, well if you want to pull out your hair a little bit more, so, like, out of all of my ultra-moderate reforms that I've suggested, the one that I stand behind more strongly than any other is abolishing foreign language requirements in the United States. Because there, like, we've got, like, a bunch of facts, which is hardly any jobs use, the, you know, use foreign languages, takes enormous, it takes a lot of time to get any good. And then furthermore, I, like, in this book, I'm able to go and snap together a bunch of data, a bunch of pieces of data to show that... Virtually zero Americans claim to even claim to have learned to speak a foreign language very well in school, right? And so I say, look, like even if it had did have these big payoffs, the system is just a waste of time because we and people spend years doing it for nothing. And even here, like I just run against a brick wall and say, well, in that case, we should just improve the teaching of the foreign language. Like, well, how about you do that and then get back to me? But like <laughs> continuing to fund the thing that we have, this is garbage. And like, yeah. and like, and again, and again, like in the like, I think Washington State, from what I understand, now allows kids to use a computer language in place of a foreign language. Like, why not do that? It's like, no, no, we need to do both. They're like, people don't have an unlimited amount of time, and that shouldn't teenagers be able to have a freaking childhood? Like how how much other childhood do you want to destroy with jumping through these stupid hoops? Yeah, it, it makes me incredibly mad. I mean, like the, there is some value in learning a, a foreign language. You get like some income gain uh, depending on the language, but it doesn't yeah. matter if no one's learning it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. If, well, we just need to teach it better, Rob. It's, that's yeah. the that's the answer. Yeah. Well, we, 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 or, we can we can fund it once we figured out how to teach it. I guess. Yeah. I mean, when, when my when my uh, older kids were in high school for uh, got three weeks of high school Spanish, I could see why the, the acquisition so poor. They had three weeks of Spanish where they were not taught any Spanish. It was just rambling lectures in English about the history of Spain. And I was like, what is this stuff? Yeah. 
I mean, I really feel that there's, there's two ways you can go. I, I learned Spanish by living in Spain for a year. Uh, oh, nice. and, and that worked and it was pretty easy because you just get it all the time. But I learned more or less nothing, uh, you know, at high school before that. And I think you either have to go all the way and learn it properly by, by traveling there or just give up. Don't even start. By the way, this is one where I mean, I think there is pretty solid evidence in favor of the immersion technique of teaching foreign languages where you just ban English in the classroom and it's hardcore from day one. But again, almost like, like colleges frequently do it. And I think a foreign language acquisition in college seems a lot, you know, like clearly better to me. But and the like high schools just don't do it. And again, it, just, you know, it seems to me like the evidence is all there. And they just have so much inertia and they just have so little interest in actually even using the time they have valuably that the knowledge, however, of better pedagogy just stays unused on the shelf. And this is what I see so much going on with education when someone says, let's just improve it. I say, look, there's so many things that are already known to improve it. They're not being used. And when someone has that bad of an attitude towards evidence, I think they, they should have less money. Yeah. So uh, one place where I, where I think I might disagree with you on the transfer learning uh, is in writing, uh, or at least my, my experience is that basically all of the writing I've done feel just, I feel just makes me better at writing in other situations. Writing essays makes me better at writing emails. I think, you know, writing blog posts makes me better at, uh, you know, pr- probably do, doing these podcasts or, you know, at least writing up the, the blog post with a, with a, with a podcast. Do you agree that there are some, you know, generic skills that people can improve that, that have wide applicability? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So for the writing, I'm, I'm very inclined to agree with you. If you've got, you know, like if you're putting in a lot of effort or, or you have a really good teacher, and again, you know, a teacher that actually gives you line by line feedback on your writing. What I'm skeptical about is that normal normal writing classes are having these broad effects. So again, like you know, like, the, you know, like the typical crummy English class where you just go and write like five essays in the whole year, and and then the teacher just gives you puts a grade on it, maybe corrects a couple spelling mistakes. That's what I don't think is improving. Um, you know, but you know, on the other hand, if like you're if you know, if you're going very hardcore, if you're writing an essay every single week with detailed feedback, then I completely believe that that works. And in fact, that is the main way that I invest my time in homeschooling my older sons is on improving the writing. And that's one where like every essay, like you know, I sit both of them down and we go over each essay with with a, with a fine tooth comb. And I mean, I can I, you know, again, it's very easy to see the improvements there. Even there, they, like, like when they switched from history to English, then the general lesson of answer the question was lost at first. Although I think that it was easy, easier to regain the knowledge of, remember, answer the question they asked you. Don't just ramble on about the general topic. Easier to get someone to apply, to apply that when, they've already, when they already learned, for, learned in another subject. And, you know, when, when, you, when you're asked a history question, answer the history question. Then when you're asked an English question, answer the English question. Like, oh, yeah. And so, I mean, here's the thing is that None of this research shows that transfer doesn't happen or that it couldn't happen. It just shows that not much of it happens in the real world, right? And, and there are actually you know, a couple of prominent transfer researchers who claim to have discovered the magic bullet. I've got the techniques that do work. Generally, it's only one person who believes in each particular technique. Uh, so there's like each guy has his own magic bullet and no one else is convinced. But you know, like, even if they're right, I just say this doesn't explain what's going on in the current system. And that's really what I'm trying to understand. But yeah, I mean, I mean, there's there's a lot of areas where it seems like transfer could happen, and out of people, not just that I know, but I bet out of a lot of your listeners, I bet that they transfer a lot, because a lot of it is more about attitude and curiosity and determination and follow through than about logic. So again, there's something where, given that the logic of transfer is clear, it's all like the failure for it to happen is all about psychologic, and and again, as to what it is, what it is it takes to get the psychologic into in, in tune with logic, I think it's you know determination and curiosity. But that's much easier said than done. It's like, be curious, have determination. Like, oh, okay, <laughs> well, yes, sir. I didn't realize. <laughs> Yeah, when you're saying that a lot of the things that people learn, uh, they, they they never use later in life, it does, doesn't quite resonate with me because I feel like I use my economics training every day. I mean, I think you can see both mm-hmm. of us using our economics training training here. Uh-huh. Uh, I mean, I use it just yeah. all the time. I feel in, both in my work and in my ordinary life. Uh, am I just an exception? And like, might many yeah, of the listeners be an exception? Yeah, you're you're, you're extreme exceptions. So, like, if if you go and talk to you know typical econ you know, econ undergraduate five years out, they can still do supply and demand. I mean, I don't think they can do much else. I mean, maybe they can make it more depressing. Like, so there are a lot of econ uh, of majors who will just miss very basic questions on opportunity cost unless you've just retaught them opportunity cost, right? And then you'll think, oh, so I mean, this, this is one, like, uh, you listen to the podcast with Russ Roberts. So there are a lot of economists who don't walk out of movies. Like, econ professors don't walk out of movies. 
And you're just like, and, and, and Russ was saying, well, I don't think it's so complicated. Like, it is. It's not complicated. Come on. You wouldn't pay. You wouldn't have paid to be there. Right. You know, someone would have to pay you to see, to watch this movie. And no one is paying you to stay in your seat once uh, after you've already paid the money. So you don't like it. Just walk out. Like, what, how hard is this? And yet, I mean, again, I, I think I, I, I I doubt that I doubt that even half of econ professors walk out of movies. And if they and if they were complaining about it again, the transfer, I think you like you would actually have to go and tell them. You realize how against the sunk cost. You know, you're just in, this is just the sunk cost fallacy. And then you know, I think a lot of them are like, um, well, oh yeah, I guess it is. And then go and then they, they don't change their life. So I mean, like a while back, I went and blogged about how four behavioral economists, uh, very prominent ones, uh, what, you know, what their portfolios look like. And all four basically said they had portfolios that the research says are stupid portfolios. And I'm just like, like, what is wrong with you? Like, why do you do this? And I'm trying to remember, one, one of them, I can't remember if it was Akerlof or Kahneman, but you know, you just said, well, I mean, I just think that if I thought about it, I would just make myself unhappy. So I just go and do a simple rule of thumb, which, yeah, I wouldn't recommend to anyone else, but that's what I do. And again, like to me, just so frustrating. But I mean, like this, this is the way a, a lot of people approach economics is it's like a game. So you get publications out of it, or maybe you, maybe you go and write things, but you don't actually really use it to, to a change behavior. Whereas, yeah, I mean, I try to use a change behavior all the time. I mean, all the way down to something as simple as, look, I mean, this, this is like, like what one that is so, so it's so mundane, but like, and again, Rob, you know, like you're so grounded, you might even have trouble believing this, but you know, like, like, like when it's time to go to a kid's birthday party, my wife will say, look, we, oh, we need to go to the store and get that kid a present. And I'll say, why don't we just give him some money? And you know, we can't do that. And like, and like, look, you think the kid is going to be mad that he got money? And they're like, like, well, I mean, not the kid, the parents, like the parents have, are, are, are too, are, are, have so little going on in their lives that they're going to go and hold a grudge against us because we gave their kid money instead of a toy. Like, like, no, like, look, it's easier for us and the other people will, will be totally oblivious to us and won't care or be happier. So why don't we just do it? Like, no, we can't do that. Ah! <laughs> All right. This is, this will be a lot of fun, but, <laughs> but we should move on. Okay. Let's, let's push on and talk about your essay on totalitarianism. Yeah. Uh, this was in a compendium book, uh, Global Catastrophic Risks, that I think came out mm-hmm. in about 2011. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you just d- describe the, the problem that you were describing there? Well, so in the 20th century, we saw the rise of what are called totalitarian regimes, uh, which are, you know, governments that basically control uh, like, like, you know, all the important aspects of society and human life. And if you're a utilitarian, it seemed to make people really unhappy. And again, if you also just think of, if you believe in some of the, you know, if you are not a Philistine, you might also say, even if the people are happy, they have crushed the true meaning out of human existence. And if you could just, you know, if they just bred people like totalitarianism, it would still be terror. It would still be a, a terrible hellish dystopia. So anyway, so, you know, like, so, you know, countries like this have existed and, you know, like the standard examples are usually, you know, like stay you know, the Soviet Union under Stalin. And then, you know, Nazi Germany, usually, all, although only in like the last year is like, like people who specialize in it will say it's only really the last year that the totalitarian ideology actually becomes and you know, actually you know, they actually start living up to it. Of course, uh, you know, Khmer Rouge in Cambodia and you know, like, you know, like, like, you know, China, you know, China under Chairman Mao. Anyway, so it's places where, you know, like, like sort of like every little aspect of human life is being controlled by a horrible and oppressive government. Right. And again, this, 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 this is an outcome that haunted, you know, the idea that this could actually become the normal human method of government haunted George Orwell. It's the inspiration for 1984, uh, where in 1984, the world is divided between three totalitarian governments with perpetual war, perpetual peace. I mean, this book is, you know, unbelievably influential in that how so many of our concepts about the world actually are straight out of this book. You know, like double think, double speak. Memory hole. Yeah, 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 yeah. Memory, memory hole. Yeah, you know, it's like you know, so many of these concepts are, you know, like unperson. The unperson is, is is out of that, or from this book. So when you know Nick Bostrom was putting together this book on global catastrophic risks, I've been very interested interested in the history of, tel- tel- of totalitarianism. So I said, all right, so why don't I go and write a chapter on this horrible catastrophe of humanity remains alive, but we are, but we're stuck under the rule of one or more totalitarian totalitarian governments, and they basically crush the meaning out of human existence and turn us into these horrible robots. So that that's sort of that's sort of the background. And then in the paper, I try to use what knowledge we have to think about, like you know, how likely is this, and what what are the ways that it's that it's likely to occur. And again, my you know, so my main story is uh, inspired by well, you know, by Orwell, but also others is that. Seems like the main reason why totalitarian regimes don't last is that there are non-totalitarian regimes that are around, which 
uh, has a bunch of salutary effects. One is that you know totalitarian regimes are generally very uncreative, and you know at best they can maintain maintain the living standards they had before. Usually, can't even do that. And so this mean, and so this means that over time, especially people you know, like as long as there's any awareness of what's going on outside of the total, of the totalitarian country, they know that things are getting better and better in the non-totalitarian world, and say and staying bad in the in the totalitarian world. So that's one thing is just the comparison group. Uh, you know, there's a comparison group that you can look at and see. You know, another thing that's going on is of course military competition. Where if the non-totalitarian world keeps growing, eventually they will have a big military edge over the totalitarian world, and that's another way that the totalitarian world may militarily not be able to compete, right? And then there's also just the question of maintaining the morale of the inner elite or of, of the inner circle of the leaders, which I say in practice is the real problem for totalitarian regimes. It's not like the Soviet Union couldn't have just stayed the Soviet Union. But the problem was that the people for that were for its durability was the people at the top lost lost their faith in their own system, right? Which again has a lot to do with there's another system that you can look at and see it's better. So anyway, put all this together and said, if there ever were to be a time when totalitarian regimes basically took over the whole surface of the earth, then whether it was a, a bunch of them or just one, you've removed most of the main reason most of the main reasons why it isn't stable. And in which case, you know, maybe it could go on for thousand years, ten thousand years. Uh, which again, like you know, I, I guess compared to some of the other global catastrophic risks of permanent extinction of humanity, is not as bad, but still uh, seems like a pretty bad outcome, nonetheless. So that's my main story. And then I, then I also, this is my most science fictiony essay where I think about different ways in which totalitarian, you know, totalitarianism could have been extended. So you know, like fun fact is Stalin actually had a life extension program dedicated to trying to make himself immortal. It, it didn't work, but. You know, my view is if it worked, then I think the Soviet Union would still be ruled by Joseph Stalin. I, I really do. I um, mean, you know, again, like, you know, 80% probability anyway. You know, like he really did crack the nut of how do you may gain and maintain absolute power. And again, like there's nothing, you know, like, one, like he was able to get nuclear weapons. So once he got nuclear weapons, I don't see there's anything that else that happened in the outside world that would have made him do anything, really. Hmm. So to me, this is kind of one of the, the medium uh, magnitude global catastrophic risks. All mm-hmm. right, I think we might disagree about uh, mm-hmm. some of some of the top tier ones. I'm I'm worried about risks from artificial intelligence and and, and new biotechnology. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. but the risk of you know a, a stable totalitarian or authoritarian regime seems mm-hmm. to me uh, you know reasonably significant. And there's not a whole lot of people mm-hmm. thinking or right. mm-hmm. thinking or working on that, especially in the effective altruism community. It's more mm-hmm. or less totally absent. Right. Um, and I think for, for me, uh, the reason that I worry is that it seems like there's a lot of technologies that could be developed that would make totalitarianism uh, a lot more stable. So we mm-hmm. just talked about life extension. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did an interview with uh, Anders Sandberg where he has written a paper about uh, whether life extension would actually make totalitarianism more stable, and, and he was a bit skeptical. Uh, oh. So I'll stick up a link to that. Yeah, interesting. So again, you know, a lot of this comes down to whether, like, how much you believe in great man theories of history. And I have moderate belief in great man theories of history. So again, a lot, you know, a lot, you know, there's a lot of economists and other social scientists who like structural theories where the individual leader doesn't make much difference. I mean, but like, I would just say, like, I know way too much history of the Soviet Union to think that that isn't all plausible. Like, it's it's really true that like within weeks of Stalin dying, there are radical policy changes that you would have been shot for, uh, for even suggesting beforehand. So like the idea that Stalin that Stalin was not personally, single-handedly crucial for so much of the bad stuff just seems completely factually wrong to me. Yeah. I think Anders's main piece of evidence is just that although it's true that you're likely to get regime shifts when the leader dies or becomes sick, they still do fairly frequently lose power before that. Uh, and so <laughs> he was trying to estimate, you know, how if you had life extension, how much would it extend the life mm. of a regime? And it was, you know, mm. only a moderate amount, basically, because like they, they still can collapse for other reasons. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would say that again for like the real hardcore totalitarian ones, then I just don't see that at all. So again, like through the, like the like the Eastern European ones collapse, that's because the Gorbachev comes in power, and so I mean that's one where it's all correlated, where you have a bunch of leaders that are not the real leaders, and like, like they're they're you know not full Soviet puppets, but close to Soviet puppets. Like the Soviet, the Soviet approach in before Gorbachev was, you know, the Brezhnev doctrine. You know, what we have, we hold, and that seemed again like super stable. So the only one out of the totalitarian regimes I was mentioning, the only one that I know of that actually didn't just last as long as the life of the leader was uh, Cambodia under Pol Pot. That's where another almost a totalitarian regime, uh, you, know, you know, Vietnam, you know, invaded, invaded, and, and took over. Although, notice Cambodia did not have nuclear weapons. So like once you've got a well-established totalitarian ruler, and you've got you know, nuclear weapons. 
of course, you know, it's so true that the you know, internal pressure got rid of Khrushchev, although, again, like his main thing was actually ramping the totalitarians down a lot. If you try the other approach, yeah, I mean, and, you know, you know it's, it's one where there are like there are these periods when like, like, you know, like you know, the before you get the total stranglehold on the system. And then, and then, and then, you, then you might still get toppled. But like when you do get to the stranglehold point, and again, like it seemed, and it seems like there's a pretty nice checklist of well, how do you know? Well, when anyone who breathes a word of criticism, you expect to die. That's well, you know, North you know, like, Korea. Like people, yeah, 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 yeah. So like, yeah. I mean, like North North Korea. I, I remember that when uh, Kim Jong Un, uh, when, when, well, rather when Kim Jong Il died, I went home th- that night to my kids and I said, like, this is really exciting. Like, it could be good, be good, be bad. But I said, look, I said, look, anything could be happening there right now. The next few days, they could be killing that kid right now. They could be killing Kim Jong Un right now. They could be murdering each other. Like, like any, like there could be a massive purge, the preemptive attacks. Anything could be happening. And then a couple years later. Then Kim Jong Un has his uncle executed, and I'm like, all right, I think I think he's got I think he's got things pretty well under control now, and um, so I'm not totally. You know, I mean, I'm I'm almost ready to go and bet that Kim Jong Un will rule until his death, right? <laughs> yeah. At this point, uh, even though he's only like 31, but uh, hopefully his life life won't be very long, but. Mm. Yeah, I was actually going to go in the direction of talking about yeah other other technologies that could uh, mm-hmm. could extend totalitarian rule. You, you've probably seen this um, new uh, Chinese social credit system mm-hmm. where they're yeah. that they're, they're ranking each person mm-hmm. based on well you know a bunch of things like how nice are they to their families and how good are they at their jobs mm-hmm. and and also just how loyal are they to the state and this then determines potentially whether they can get loans and whether they can get jobs and whether they can move within the country. And people are a little bit concerned about this, but I, I got is this a ten alarm fire? Is is this going to be a technology that in China could totally stabilize the regime forever uh, or, and, and could spread to other countries and, and make authoritarianism uh, very stable in general. What do you think of that? Yeah, so I mean, I mean, good that you use the word authoritarianism because you know, I, I think it's like that. You know, China would no no longer be reasonably called totalitarian. So part of part of it is, you know, like you know, I'm I'm no longer nearly as worried when it's only authoritarian. Like most of you know, most, like humanity has lived under authoritarian regimes for most of human history, and you know, human life has had meaning for most of the time. You know, I think if it's only under the totalitarian regimes, then it's truly like you know, the, you know this this hell state. But yeah, I mean, I I think it's you know very sensible to worry. And again, I can you can see this being pretty stable as long as the government goes and punishes someone for coming up with an alternative rank uh, credit rating that takes out the loyalty to the state part right because again like, like you know in a, in a free system the government could rank you but if someone else were free to give you a, to give you a different ranking that that ignored the ignored the political stuff then it would make sense for employers to say yeah well I don't care about his politics I just care about whether he will repay the loan but yeah but if government if governments were to do this yeah that, that you know, makes quite a bit of, you know quite a bit of sense I mean I mean I would say this is again probably just Formalizing something that's already in existence. So, you know, like North Korea has long had a whole a whole caste system based upon perceived loyalty to the regime. This is just one where, uh, at the margin, it's easier to move up or down. Whereas in the in the North Korean system, it's much more heavily based upon uh, you know, the uh, the caste of your parents and grandparents. But yeah, you know, like yeah, that, that makes 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 a great deal of sense that this would be amplifying it. I I guess I would think of this as. 25% worse than what these regimes, like totalitarian regimes, do already. For China, again, since it liberalized quite a bit, then I think it's probably you know, a, a bigger step in a bad direction. What about the fact that mass surveillance is getting a lot cheaper? So it's possible mm-hmm. for government... Uh, yeah. like like the Chinese one to just have cameras everywhere and follow you know mm-hmm. figure out where everyone's going and potentially monitor most of their communications that seems mm-hmm. like it would like that would allow yeah. the intelligence services to stabilize the government for a long a long mm-hmm. time yeah I mean you know as long as they're willing to back it up with some kind of threats which of course you know could be actual jail time or whatever it could just be as you're saying you're know, ruining ruining their government credit score and in that case you don't even have to have a lot of people locked up yeah I mean so somewhat concerned concerned about that and there is the question about whether you know China will go and make credit card companies go and base the ratings based on the government rather than do their own, right? Because yeah. you know as long as long as there's some competing credit rating that is genuinely informative and it sort of strips away the pure obedience to authority part in favor of whether you're a good trading partner, then I wouldn't be so worried. But if the government is going to actually be serious and try to stamp out these alternative measures, then yeah, then you know it does seem pretty scary. Think about where we would where we would be rated. <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd rate you better than me i'd give you a better social credit score than me but uh, I, I don't think either of us would be doing too well no i i, I don't imagine 
So if a listener wanted to work on this problem, you know, make it less likely that you'd have a stable totalitarian or authoritarian regime, uh, is there is there anything that you've envisaged that people could do that would be hmm. helpful? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, there's the, you know, an answer which is not in spirit of my education book is just saying, uh, you know, like, learn the history of totalitarian regimes because those who uh, don't know the past are doomed to repeat it. I want that to be true, and yet everything I know about transfer learning just says that even people who know history usually just deploy it for their own nefarious purposes and don't really use it in a, in a fair-minded way uh, to figure out the best thing to think. So, like, in terms of, like, what could actually be done. So, of course, there is voting on the basis of whether someone plausibly is going to be totalitarian. You know, there's there, there's something like that. Uh, you know, I like to... I'm sure that would never come up, Brian. Yeah. Yes. But, you know, of course, a lot of what this would mean is just voting for people who are very boring. Just vote for the boring person with no new ideas. Because, you know, assuming that you're not totalitarian now, then the boring person with no new ideas isn't going to do that. So, I mean, I will say that I'm always nervous whenever a, any political side has a new inspiring leader. And I'm like, oh, great, another one of these guys. Another so another person who's going to get people excited. That's the worst possible thing that could happen. Is that you know, like, well, not worst possible, but it's the worst likely thing is they're going to get excited and motivated, and they're just probably going to mess things up. So I guess um, you were a big Hillary supporter then, Brian. Yeah, just the, the, yeah. Most, the most boring possible. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I like, like actually, like, like you know, early in the election, I just said, you know, she's a lesser evil because like she doesn't, she inspires very little enthusiasm, and would immediately have a hostile Congress, and so we'll just have gridlock. And I said, that's about the best that I think I think this is likely to happen. So I'm, I'm surprised they didn't yeah. invite you to speak at the DNC conference, Brian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so I guess there's also a reform of like intelligence and surveillance law might, mm-hmm. might be an option. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I mean, especially given that like the existing system seems in total violation of a bunch of laws that we already have in the books and yet nobody seems to care. I don't know what to do about that. Uh, than to tell people to care. I mean, you know, like, how can get, like, government is collecting all this information without a warrant? They don't have probable cause. How do they do it? And it's like, well... You they know, have a secret I mean, court, Brian, that says that it's fine. Yes. And I'm like, well, like, what? <laughs> I mean, I mean you know, like, you know, like, when I was having arguments with people about uh, about Snowden, and they're saying, look, he broke the law. And I'm like, look, the government broke the law by doing it in the first place. He's just exposing what they're doing. How can you say he's breaking the law? And... Like no no no, the government says he's breaking the law, and you and and only the government can say whether it's breaking the law itself. And like well, th- then like how is this any different from from any dictatorship or anything else? And like, but you know, like just the way that it doesn't seem to bother people at all, or like you know very few people actually actually care. I think I'm like like currently I don't see that it's really, that it's doing very much again. But you know, there is this downside risk, which is kind of the whole point of thinking about global catastrophic risk. Yeah, I mean. I think for many other global catastrophic risks, having good intelligence and surveillance could be quite important. So for me, the, the focus would be on you know regulating collection of intelligence and making sure that laws are followed such that you're less likely to get authoritarian backsliding because abuse isn't possible. But it is, it's difficult to do because just the intelligence services in general aren't that accountable to, to the public because there's so many layers in between them and voters. Yeah, and you might remember in that chapter, I did talk about the worst case scenario for totalitarianism being one world government. Mm. Right. And saying, you know, it seems to me this is the scenario that is most likely to lead to permanent totalitarianism if you've eliminated all outside comparison groups, all outside checks, any need even to go and maintain economic growth for military reasons. And I thought this is interesting just because there's a lot of other global catastrophic risks that people think of plausibly of one world government as being the solution. At least wanted to say there is a trade off where you are risking this other one to a greater extent at the same time that you that you are perhaps reducing the risk of these others, but at least be aware there is a trade off. Yeah, that, that's where I was about to go next, because a lot of people in the effective altruism community are very focused on improving international coordination in order mm-hmm. to, to deal with, I guess, issues like climate change and reduce the risk mm-hmm. of, you know, a serious war, mm-hmm. and also to, to regulate dangerous technologies so that you can't, you mm-hmm. kind of have to have most countries willing to regulate them. Otherwise, someone will find a place mm-hmm. to use them. And, and then if, if one person using it is, is, is bad, then kind of you have to get everyone on board. But of course, there's a trade-off that if, if you have mm-hmm. lots of international coordination, then you can also just stabilize a, a bad global mm-hmm. system and mm-hmm. remove competition. I mean, how, how do you feel about the, the trade-off there? Do, do you think more, more global coordination makes us safer or, or more at risk? I mean, just based upon the principle that the best predictor of future performance is past performance, I don't see that global coordination has, has yielded great fruit. If someone would say it's given us some improvements on, a few, on sort of like marginal wars, like are less bloody and, and, and are shorter, and you know, like the you know, and countries recover from them more rapidly, famines work out a bit better. So you know th- those those seem like plausible ones. But in terms of like, has it actually led to stable world peace, right? Or actually, has it even reduced the risk of a really bad outcome? Has it reduced the risk of, of of a serious war between great powers? 
you know, that that to me at least seems pretty dubious that we, there's been much gain there. So, interesting. You know, you know, oh, I feel I feel pretty differently. It it seems to me like uh, you know international institutions have reduced the risk of war quite a lot uh, and could have been essential in uh, preventing mm-hmm. you know a war between the U.S. and and Russia. Uh, and, and also just having, you know, international norms against against conflict between countries, you know, anti-nuclear proliferation work, mm. arms control in general. Uh, I, I mean, and there's been some gains, I think, uh, in, in fighting climate change, uh, although, mm. you know, we haven't done a great job of coordinating mm. there. I mean, so during the Cold War, I can't, I mean, again, I, I know the history pretty well. I can't think of any case where I thought that the United Nations did much to reduce tensions between the U.S. and Soviet Union. I mean, so, you know, the case of the Korean War is is bizarre if you know the history because, uh, the Soviets walked out, and so they didn't exercise their veto, and that's the only reason why United Nations troops were able to even be in the Korean War. And I mean, I have read in the what read, read in the world what in the world were they thinking? As I, I, mean, as I recall, the, they yeah, thought that yeah. it would make a look America look bad or something like that. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I, recently, I did look this up once. <laughs> Yes, but you know, so that so that so that's a case where you might say it. Although again, that just led to war between a Soviet-backed client state and the nominally the United Nations, although really only the U.S.-friendly parts of the United Nations. And then for the rest of it, I don't see that that, uh, that there was really, really anything that was accomplished by the United Nations there. So you know, since the end of the Cold War, then it's more possible that it, that it's made a difference. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll try to find the quote there from the Soviet ambassador mm-hmm. to to the UN because I can't quite recall what the reason mm-hmm. was. What 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 about the World Trade Organization though? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, so that, that that's actually a better one. Although know, that's one where it's you know I don't think it's done much in the way of peace. But yeah, in terms of improving trade, then yeah. I th- so I'm not sure. You know, not you know, like far from sure. And that you know, I haven't really looked at the data very much. But like you know, people that I respect say that it say, say that it's been very important. So yeah, it's, in terms of what the counterfactual would be, how much higher tariffs would be, there's some question. But yeah, no, no, that, that you know, that, you're right. That's a good counterexample. What about you know agreements to reduce nuclear stockpiles? Do you think that's made us safer? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, again, I think those are those are basically bilateral. Again, the ones ones that are important. So I mean, like nuclear nonproliferation. That's the, those are ones where it's actually interesting as, as to what's occurred. So I mean, again, of course, the you know, a common story about why North Korea is, is going so far and trying to get nukes is because Libya got rid of its program and then almost immediately got it got, got double crossed and uh, and and uh, Gaddafi was taken out. So in terms of whether like you know, like international institutions are mattering very much there, whether it's basically just the United States and, and bilateral pressure. I mean, I, I incline more to the second. Maybe, maybe it's making a bit of a difference. But, and then, by the way, of course, it's also worth uh, you know factoring in other you know, earlier failures. So, League of Nations generally considered an enormous failure, and uh, probably rightly so. What, what about the Geneva uh, Convention? What, what yes. about what about making yeah. war illegal? <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, that that is an interesting one. I mean, the, the Geneva Convention um, is fun because so I think it's actually the Hague. If you go and read it, the rules are so stringent. It would be very hard to really do much of anything, actually. Like the rules for like how the treatment of prisoners and so on, it's they're so rigid that like like, like how do they do you want to expect to fight a war under these conditions? And the way it worked out is there's some rules like the poison gas that they actually mostly followed, and there's other ones like the treatment of prisoners where they don't really do it. Uh, again, you know, like, so they don't actually go and uh, take risks to their own people just to go and capture prisoners just because they're surrendering. Instead, you know, if you saw. Uh, saving Private Ryan, there's some prisoners and they're kind of inconvenient to take, so they just kill them. I mean, I'm totally against the Geneva Convention, but it happens anyway. It sounds like it's a very difficult trade-off to make, and I'd be interested mm-hmm. in, in, in having someone look into this, whether potentially mm-hmm. uh, effective altruism mm-hmm. is causing harm by promoting international coordination in, in a way that, mm-hmm. it, that it could be dangerous in future. Mm-hmm. I guess I think I'm still fairly pro, pro-coordination, pro mm-hmm. uh, but, uh, but, but we should consider the downside seriously. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in terms of how far we are from the downside, I don't see that anything much has happened yet. So I'm not someone who thinks that the United Nations has, is effectively pushing much of anything. I Meaning, you know, essentially, they still really need the cooperation of, of, all, of all the countries in order to get them to go along with it. It's all, and you know, you know, there's a few rogue countries that will just to, that are just totally defiant or almost totally defiant. But again, like you know, a lot of it is they just define their goals so loosely that almost everyone gets to say they're in compliance with it. Uh, you know, you know, again, like you know, you know, United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. Like what country has ever actually been officially declared to be in violation of it and then face sanctions? I don't know. Maybe someone has, but it's basically just just a lot of hot air. I mean, you know, it'd be one thing if you know if the United Nations were seriously in charge of determining what human rights on Earth were. Then I think I would be nervous uh, that they would just make a you know, do a bunch of terrible things. But uh, again, of course, uh, United Nations makes education a human right. So it's like, does every country have to go and spend as much as South Korea on education or be declared a human rights violator? 
just uh, just send them your book, Brian. <laughs> so let's push on to just the last topic, which is okay. effective deontology or perhaps effective yeah. you know human rights protection. Mm-hmm. So personally, I'm I'm kind of a consequentialist and kind of focused on welfare. Uh, and kind, 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 kind of. I've never seen any sign that you're anything less should- than. Full blown, hundred percent. Died in the wool. You should you should listen listen to the episode of moral uncertainty, Brian. Uh, where, ah. where, all, all things considered, I try to take into account you know other views that are plausible, uh, which is kind of why why I'm asking you about this. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm I'm trying to look for kind of the greatest suffering to, to prevent. But but you're kind of you take a more libertarian view. Uh, you're more concerned about human rights and prevention of coercion. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in light of that, uh, for, for people who shared your your moral outlook, uh, what do you think would be the, the most effective things for them to work on that people aren't currently focused on? Mm. Yeah, very good question. So, I mean, for me, you know, like like my big personal cause is uh, you, know, you know deregulation of immigration. So right now, I mean, I'm working on a nonfiction graphic novel on the ethics and uh, ethics and science of open borders, right? So you know, like I, I've been a big pusher of open borders for a long time. This is one where, you know, my view is that you know, like whether utilitarian or you know, like broader consequentialist, or whether you believe you know like, like you focus on human rights or other deontological standards, like all of them actually wind up pointing in the same direction. Although I will still say I think that not nearly enough attention is paid for deregulation of migration. Mm-hmm. So I mean that you know that that you know that is the main uh, the cause that I'm that I'm most enthusiastic about. It's the one that I'm most convinced. Again, you know, t- taking into account moral uncertainty, there's so many different views that all push very strongly towards at least very strong deregulation of immigration. And in the book, I try to bring together both the evidence and all the philosophic perspectives as well. So there's a chapter where I go through a bunch of different philosophers and how all of them should respond to the science. And so, you know, so, so um, you know, for me, that's probably probably the main one. This is one where, you know, in, ter- in terms of alleviation of harm, alleviation of suffering, uh, suffering, alleviation of poverty, but also equality of opportunity and just, you know, like, you know, right of, right of someone to go and take a job from a willing employer and rent from a willing landlord. All these point in, point in the same direction. But, you know, I will say, you know, like a lot of the reason why I'm so enthused is because this is one where someone says, isn't it terrible that people are so poor? Let's help them. And I can say, how about we just let them help themselves? They're able to do it. They're not intrinsically charity cases. They are you know, adults that are perfectly capable of getting a job and, and going and solving their own problem if only they would be allowed, which in, ter- you know, in terms of just sort of be, of uh, conserving um, you know, philanthropic energy, I think, makes a lot of sense. But also, I will say, you know, to me, it just seems more outrageous if there's someone who's starving on the street because the law says it's illegal for him to work than someone who's starving on the street because he's not able to work. And that's the second one is like, well, that's harder because then, like, who's going to have to be responsible for taking care of him? And, and like, and then, you know, you know there's questions like that. And in terms of, like, other things, so I am planning on doing a book called Poverty, Who to Blame? And this is one where it's not so much of a libertarian book as, again, like an, an old-fashioned puritanical book of you know, you know there's some libertarian elements but a lot of a lot of it is just trying to revive this old-fashioned distinction between the deserving and undeserving poor which yes I'm happy to recognize is a continuum it's not that you're in one category or the other but still you know there's an intuition that, that almost everyone has and which is that if someone if someone is like like you know born with a genetic ailment and you know and so they're unable to work this person is poor through no fault of their own, but there's someone who just won't get off the couch and get a job, and they're perfectly able-bodied and they don't. Then you say two people could have be in the same current situation, and yet moral intuition says you should help the person that couldn't have helped themselves, or at least where there's no reasonable way for them to help themselves. And again, like to me, these are very, very convincing intuitions. And so in this book, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is reviving this. So focusing philanthropic energy on the deserving poor. So which, again, like I think a lot of existing programs already have this intuition of mind. Like there's a lot of programs that focus on kids, right? And I think the idea is that kids, look, even if a kid could have a job, it's not really reasonable to expect a five-year-old to go and work his way out of, out of poverty. And, like, you know, and again, like most of them would just have no idea. You know, it's not reasonable to say, look, if only you were a, were a movie star kid, you know, so anyway, seeing like like any time that you're starting with kids or you're starting with people who are like severely handicapped or like born with severe handicaps, anytime you have welfare programs or philanthropy that focuses on people like this, I think you have this intuition in mind of these are people who are suffering through no fault of their own and so they should at least be first in line. So for basically for doing philanthropic triage, they're the people to help first. Now the other side of this, there again, there's a there are standard intuitions about who does not deserve your help. So like if you have a cousin who's lost his job and his and his wife because he doesn't show up to work and cheats on her, and then he comes and sleeps on her couch, and then instead of trying to get his life together, he drinks all day, and then he just says, you know, woe is me, I can't help it. Almost everyone at some point gets fed up with this and says, that's ridiculous. Of course you can help it. Uh, and you know, my view is the people who are fed up are correct. 
And so, yeah, so like I mean, part of what I want to do is to have, you know, have a decidedly unmodern view of people with substance abuse problems and just work and like, like you know, work discipline problems and just say, look, actually, you know, that intuition that they are choosing evil on purpose. And so they don't deserve much sympathy. That's a true. That, that's a good intuition. And so let's not help them or at least let's help them last. After all, the hungry kids are fed. After all, the people born, uh, you know, born without legs have, have you know have, have been have been helped out. Then maybe we'll consider your cousin. But until that day, he's you know, like he's on his own. Again, there's sort of sort of a a response people often have. They say like, "How is this my problem?" Which again, of course, you could say to a starving orphan too. But people are not generally inclined to say to the starving or starving orphan, "How is this my problem?" Where someone whose wife won't talk to him anymore because he cheated on her five times, cheated on her five times. Like, well, then why am I supposed to go and intercede on your behalf for you? Like, why? Why should I? Like, is, aren't you just getting your just desserts? So, I mean, I, and again, I would think of that as part of you know, and, you know, sort of like an, an, another kind of uh, deontological effect of altruism. Yeah. I think, well, as a, as a consequentialist, the reason to help some of those people and not others is because they'll respond to incentives differently. That uh, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, you're not yeah. going to create more orphans potentially by by feeding orphans, mm-hmm. uh, whereas whereas you might create more lazy people by mm-hmm. by giving them lots of money for being lazy. Or of course, a, cla- a, cl- a classic answer. Although often, when you really scrape the surface, you find maybe not. So you know, there are there are people who will actually just you know, like like you know, in, in, in desperate circumstances, they'll just put their kid out in the street as a beggar when they were able to care for the kid. Or, you know, like read about some of the stuff that Nicholas Kristof has done in third world countries of like dads with kids that don't have mosquito nets spending money on, on, on tobacco, alcohol and prostitutes. And it's like, well, look, this is horrible. But uh, I mean, the, again, the idea that, uh, you know, like, you know, like, you know, so maybe the dads would respond to incentives. But again, it seems like at least a lot of times when you sort of broaden the idea of all the margins, it's no longer all that clear what's going on. But I don't think the intuition is 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 all that changed. Um, you know, one of, one of my favorite one you know, thought experiments is you know you're stuck in an island for the rest of your life in 1945, and then who happens to wash up at Hitler? And you're both going to be stuck on the island for the rest of your life. And what should you do, right? And you know, so do you go and befriend Hitler? Do you and say, well, I mean, he's not going to do any like no, everyone thinks he's dead. It's not going to change any incentives at this point. Or do you just avoid him because you don't want to get contaminated by his evil? And you're like, you know, he's an old man. He's not going to hurt you anymore, right? Or do you go and kill him to re, to balance the moral scales? <laughs> well, and I would so, say to create incentives. That retribution yeah. helps to create incentives for other people. Yeah, but, 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 no, but yeah, the whole no. thought experiment is designed to kill off uh, to say there's no incentives that will ever be given. Yeah. I mean, and yet, if you watch watch enough movies about revenge, as I have, like almost everyone on some level thinks that you should torture Hitler to death in the in the in the most horrible way that you can imagine. And then there's some high level theory of no, no, that would make you bring you down to Hitler's level. And I'm like, really? Is it really bring you down to Hitler's level? I, mean, I know there, there's there's also there's there's a bunch of movies where the hero goes and mows down like 200 minions, and then he finally gets to the horrible guy who's responsible for it all and says, <laughs> "Kill you would make me as bad as you." And like, well. <laughs> like, well, you kill all the minions who weren't nearly as bad as this guy. So, what are you talking about? Yeah, that, that's a case where I feel uh, the intuition is unreliable because uh, it, it would be so abnormal. It basically, it would never happen that you have a case where people would never find out what you're doing. That the, basically, we, we've evolved uh, an intuition about retribution and punishment that applies basically everywhere. And then, when you change the situation such that there are no incentives created, the intuition is no longer reliable. But but that that would take us down a different line of conversation. I d- I just wanted to ask you, why is it that both on the left and the right, very few people, even people who are concerned about liberty and you know human rights, view immigration restrictions as a human rights violation, or, mm-hmm. or just as on its face uh, impermissible w- without you know very strong reasons uh, mm-hmm. to, to do it? Yeah. So I mean, I think the ultimate answer is that most people are nationalists first, and whatever they are, whatever else they are, second. So you know, like if you are a Christian, a Democrat, and an American, the most important one of those three identities if you really scratch the surface, is American, right? And, you know, like, you know, so like the most famously in World War I, there were dogmatic internationalist socialists who said, of course, all socialists are going to be against this war. And then what happened is almost all of, all the socialists t- took the side of their own country. And then there's a few oddballs saying, like, what just happened? But to everyone else, it's like, well, of course, German socialists are going to vote for uh, vote for the German war. French socialists will vote for the war. You know, British socialists will vote for the war. Russian socialists will vote for the war. Because the most important part of the identity, whatever they say, is nationality. 
And again, of course, you might say, well, yes, you could be, you know, like consider being an American or whatever your nationality to be your most important identity and still recognize the great benefits of, uh, of immigration for a country. But it does mean that you're going to uh, just put very little weight upon the welfare of people in other countries, which is the weight that makes it a no brainer. Right. And so, I mean, I'd say that, you know, that, you know, there are a lot of economic gains of immigration, a lot of other gains, but it's really the gain to the immigrants that that usually makes it completely beyond beyond debate. And where you say, look, you like once you factor in how much better off the immigrant is, then we can't really argue about this anymore. And if you go and set the biggest term in the equation to zero and then say still convince me then at least it's harder. Yeah. Right. And again, I think ultimately, ultimately, it still comes out usually, but but, but less strongly with less confidence and so on. And then furthermore, again, people's sense of nationality is so, is so strong that the idea that you could let someone into your country permanently and not make them a citizen is also anathema. So it's like, look, if we let them in, then they would become one of us and then we would have to care about them. And I don't want to have to care about them. It would be bad for a country if we cared about them, so we shouldn't let them in at all. And again, I've heard this argument from people from a wide variety of views. Again, is it like sort of the way they phrase it is different, but you know, like even, like even, let's see. So I'm blanking on his name for the moment, but you know, Washington University philosopher that I debated on immigration, but he's saying, look, it's okay to let people in as guest workers for a limited number of years, but it is morally wrong to let someone in, but not making them you know, for their entire life and not making them a citizen. And I'm saying, well, how about you let them in for like 99 years? And he says, no, you can't do that. All right. And, and I say, so basically this is, so everyone who comes has a right after this probationary period to become a citizen. And the primary effect of this right is going to be that people are not allowed in at all. And yet it's very important that we recognize that right. And he said, yes. So I guess this is Christopher, well- Christopher Wellman. Yeah, it is, it is perverse to have a human right that makes you so much worse off. So, uh, and not, non-waivable, not, non- totally non- <laughs> yeah, non-waivable right. I, I, I really feel perfectly fine with getting to work in your country and never become a citizen if you allow me to come to your country and work as a good... Uh, well, you I, would say that, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah but ultimately, just like, like the, the nationalism of most people is very pronounced. And even like you may say this is human nature, although it's not human nature to be... You, know, you may say, I believe it's human nature to be tribal. It's not human nature to be nationalist because most people throughout history were not nationalist. You know, great, great book by Eugen Weber, uh, Peasants and Frenchmen, said like even in the mid-19th century, most people in France barely thought of themselves as French and most didn't even speak French. There was a, it was a whole propaganda campaign to convince them that they were French. But whatever the process was, in the modern world, people do generally think of themselves first and foremost as being a member of their country. And again, you, most politics is so domestic, they may not even talk about it very much, but it's just beneath the surface, sadly. Yeah. Throughout my uh, primary and high school education, uh, I was told that I was a global citizen rather than an Australian, and maybe that's gotten to me. Maybe that maybe that actually did influence my moral outlook because because uh, I really don't view uh, you know citizenship as having much much moral relevance. And yet, yet I bet that most of your classmates, like whatever they say about global citizenship, if there were a war between Australia and the world, <laughs> would take the Australian side. <laughs> uh, uh, that's only because we'd definitely be right, Brian. So, <laughs> so a couple of years ago, I wrote a presentation where I tried to brainstorm, you know, what should libertarians or classical liberals think are their priorities for, from an effective altruism point of view or from, you know, just a general effectiveness point of view. I just wanted to throw, throw a couple of options at you. Well, what, about, what about domestic violence or this kind of, you know, small scale violence? that seems just really endemic around around the world. Hmm. So, I mean, it's the kind of thing where it's hard to know what the, what, what the numbers really mean, right? Because you figure that there's going to be a whole lot of stuff that's beneath the surface, but as to how much of that uh, that there is, it's, it's just hard to say. I mean, it's, it's also one where it's very hard to understand exactly what we would do about it. Again, sort of like a standard police procedure in the U.S. is if they're called in domestic disturbance, uh, domestic disturbance they must arrest one person. Right. So normally they'll just arrest the guy, but then they can't really hold him because they don't have any, any real witnesses or anything that gets released. So, again, you know, like, you know, I, I can imagine something, you know, doing something on like that. But again, it's hard to see exactly what you do. I mean, again, like, you know, my instinct would always just be to ratchet up the punishments. Hmm. Right. And um, I, mean, I mean, yes, yes. Uh, of, course, of course, again, like, you know, those can be costly, too. There's uh, there is a standard list of lower cost punishments we could be using, but hardly ever do. There's fine fines, of course. Uh, there's that one. Uh, that's one where. Uh, you know, you might get even fewer police called in because if the wife knows that uh, there's going to be family money that's attached, uh, there's that problem. You may have heard about this, uh, you know, ha- half tongue in cheek book called In Defense of Flogging. Have you I, heard of that? Have you heard of the book? I have. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, think, so, I think there's something to it. Uh, I'll stick up a link to yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, if if you were to go and do, you know, you know flogging for uh, for domestic violence, uh, that might actually be uh, be a bit more convincing. I, I don't know. 
I suspect that you could try, you know, broader advocacy campaigns to try to shift culture and attitudes uh, rather than use the criminal justice system. But uh, yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's it's not entirely clear what would work. What, what what about what about slavery? I mean, there's still we believe millions of slaves in the world. That's something that I don't really hear libertarians talk about that that much, even though it's kind of the, the most severe like human rights violation. Right. Yeah, I mean, so I have looked into that. I think a lot of those numbers are very misleading because they're including things like, uh, you know, like like debt like debt contracts as as being slavery, which you know, like so. Yeah, I mean, again, from not only a libertarian but effective altruism standpoint, there's a lot to be said for classical indentured servitude, where you, where someone who otherwise couldn't get a loan goes and gets a loan, and then they have to work it off. I Meaning, like, so, like, it did seem like when I looked at the numbers, they seemed like they really were advocacy numbers, where they're trying to define as many possible things as being slavery as they possibly could. Uh, so it looked like looked to me like the actual numbers were a fraction, you know, a small fraction of what the official statistics were. Uh, so again, you know, when I looked at that, still, you know, obviously disturbing. Although, you know, like as to what as to what could be done, there is the there. I think there was a kid who tried setting up a charity to buy people out of slavery. I think you can see the problem with that. In- I hope listeners can. <laughs> yes, yes, in- increasing the incentive to uh, to uh, to uh, to reduce people to slavery. Yeah. And you know, again, as as for as for what you know, what else could be done? That's the that's the tough issue. So usually, this is happening in countries that are so screwed up in so many ways. That that is not so clear what to say, and then again, like the kinds of things that are actually being targeted often are things like like child labor, where the plaza, where, where instead of legal child labor, the kids would be would, would become prostitutes, and then and then and then it's you know, not a huge improvement, yeah. Or, or worse, yeah, yeah. Yeah, again, well, you know, at least one like you know, you could either go and your parents go and say, okay, you're going to go and work for this guy as an apprentice, and yeah, you're a kid, so you don't really get to choose, and in some sense, it's involuntary. Although, on the other hand, of course, like even in this country, parents can go and make their kids do all kinds of unpleasant things, right? Or your parent, you know, and that could be legal, or you could go and have your parents go and just sell you into the black market of the prostitution markets of Thailand, where your parents aren't even around, you don't see them anymore, they aren't there to look out for you anymore, and you know, again, like this is some pretty horrible stuff. But what about the U.S. criminal justice and prison system? Yeah, so that's one where back when I believed that um, that that the large majority of people were in prison for drug offenses, I was much more enthusiastic about. Then eventually, I learned that's not you know, that's not really true. So maybe only a while. You know, like people in federal prison, like the, so there, I think it's still a case that the majority are there for you know for drug offenses. But in the overall, that it's maybe twenty percent. Um, you know, that's again probably an underestimate just because it's not it's only factoring in the official sentence rather than the whole social causation of what of why it wind up happening. So again, I could still believe that like forty percent of people wouldn't be there but for the drug war. But still that leaves leaves a whole lot in there for offenses that at least I think I think, think it is you know reasonable and just to punish people for. Even then you might say, well, like, you know, so maybe they should be punished but not but not as harshly and there's not much value to it. This is one where I will say I think libertarians have been very interested in it. So, you know, like including, of course, the Koch brothers. And again, notice they have not specifically talked about getting you know, reducing sentences for people on nonviolent offenses or just for drug offenses. They focus just in general, just trying to reduce fences, uh, offenses for people who've already aged out of crime anyway. And again, I think you know, sort of sort of in the background is the idea that, you know, the marginal deterrent effect of going from a 20 year sentence to a life sentence isn't that much for a tw- for an 18 year old male. So, you know, so, you know, that, that seems you know, reasonable in terms of, you know, saving tax dollars in terms of printing you know, printing a principle and I'd, I'd focus on the people who are in jail or innocent. So going back to deontological effective altruism, again, the first, first people that I'd get out are all the people there on immigration offenses. So, I mean, I was shocked to find out now, like in federal prison, people there for immigration offenses, it's now a substantial group. So I think it's, if I remember, it's something like 10%. Uh, 10% of the people in federal in federal prison are there for immigration offenses. Well, well, well I've heard so, that there's 600,000 people just awaiting trial mm-hmm. in immigration court. Yeah, it's astro- yeah, extraordinary. Yeah, so, that, yeah so, that's, so those cases are a bit different because I think those are generally cases where if they just agree to be deported, then, they, then they'd be freed. Ah, uh, I see. So, I mean, I mean, which again, I think is still terrible, but it's not quite as terrible as someone who just is serving a 20-year sentence for a crime and they got nothing, you know. So, I mean, basically, right now, you've got a lot of people awaiting trial where you lock up families in a horrible prison, but... The lower bound on how bad it is is you could go home. We again, of course, maybe, maybe they don't want to go home because they're worried that there's gangsters that are going to kill them or something. Right? Yeah, I think I think that that's fairly often the case, at least among like the legitimate refugees. Okay, well, I'll stick up a link to my to my presentation. I think I think you're right. Libertarians have oh, many libertarians have been quite good on the on the criminal justice and, and and prison stuff. Although I think some some others to me seem remarkably unbothered by you know government 
goons just going around and harassing people on the street. I'm not, I'm not quite sure what's going on there. Yeah. But. yeah, well, I mean, so I would say that both the unflattering and the flattering stories are all true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, yeah, I mean, like, you know, regardless of people's philosophy, a, lo- a lot of what they care about is based not upon any kind of quantitative, exa- quantitative examinational problem. It's just based upon social proof and fads and like, what are, what are my friends talking about? And, you know, you know, like there are some people who try to go and get a new fad going. I'm trying to, you know, I've been spent years trying to get the open borders fad going and saying, look, this is the main thing that we should be worried about. I mean, right now there's, you know, there, there's, a, there's a growing fad for something that I think is good, which is getting focused on deregulation of housing. Yeah. Right? So you know, you're, you're actually in the Bay Area, right? I am. Yeah. We, we have a profile yes, on this one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so, I mean, again, that's something, that's something where, again, I think there's you know, enormous gains to, to, to be had from that for like, like from almost any point of view. You know, and you know, and again, this is one where I mean, so like libertarians have been pushing this for quite a while, and, and then you know, economists uh, from a wide range of political views, and then I mean, in terms of you know, like like liberals versus conservatives, I say like sort of tepid for both you know, for both groups for for different reasons. I mean, again, you know, from from liberals, I think you know, like there's just like well, but someone would make make would make money building these houses, right? Aha! <laughs> All right, and I mean, you know, that may seem uncharitable, but it's like when I actually li- when I do talk to liberals about this, there is like this immediate like I think that you're trying to help someone make some money, like well, that would occur, yeah, someone would make some money, okay, but houses would be built. It's like no, no, no. We do, they should be built without someone making money, and like, well, that doesn't sound very realistic. And like, the houses would probably be pretty crummy. And among conservatives, you know, as to why they don't care about it, intrinsically, I, I, it seems like the kind of thing they might like, and like, you know, make it really cheap for American families to have their own home. It seems like it's really easy to make a conservative case for it. And also, you know, isn't it just like a bunch of liberal cities that are that are ruining America? And like, you've got that story, but the, you know, there isn't there isn't any like really good, sexy news like story about an individual person who can't build a home. It's too, it's too much about homes that are not built rather than uh, some some visible victims. So I think it makes it harder for it to get off the ground. And again, it's also one where like it doesn't have quite the right villain. Like again, the, the ideal conservative villain is. Like a, like a transgendered illegal immigrant who in a union, who, who, yeah, 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 in a union, yeah. So you, know, you need, you know, so put put all those things together to get your ideal villain. Whereas if it's just like local zoning boards, and then it may be that there's actually a little bit of leniency that conservatives have towards local government versus higher levels of government, also. So I, I haven't actually heard this, but I mean, the obvious conservative case against the the proposed California California state deregulation of zoning is that it's a state government that is supplanting the wish of local government, grassroots government, close to the people. I haven't heard that argument be made, but it seems like a pretty easy one to make, which would tip the scales back the other way. Yeah, being uncharitable, I suspect that the the real reason a lot of people are against uh, dezoning is that they own houses and they don't want the competition of new houses. Uh, it's just uh, they're voting their pocketbook. So, I mean, I this is the kind of story that economists love, although I spent a, a lot of the first 10 years of my career just looking at the evidence for stories like this. And in general, it just seems like it, as a rule, it does not hold up. As a rule, people don't vote their pocketbooks. And again, though, the, the main thing you could go and look, you could go and look at people with the same income level as the people that home, own, own homes or the same wealth, but who rent. And, and again, like, so like, it seems like norm, normally it's, it's more of, again, social proof and what do people in my circle believe and what does the ideology say? And, and this kind of thing seems much more important for pe- uh, people's views about almost any political question than am I personally going to be losing money? Again, the difference being like, so if it's, should someone be able to build a house right next door to me? Like that, that when it gets down to that level, then more likely self-interest gets activated. But yeah. if it's like, what about, what about in general? Should in general, should it be harder or easy to buy a house? This is one where like there's this very little evidence that people, that, that, that this makes much difference on people's political views. And again, you know, this is one where it is true that when you talk to people, sometimes they lie and, and, and overstate how good their motives are. But people would have to be Oscar, Oscar-worthy Oscar actors to be as angry as they are about deregulation of housing on moral grounds and really at self-interest. Because you know, you know, I talk to people like, so you just want to go and let everyone just build anything they want and they can build your giant pink Disneyland right there and that's what you that's your world. And, that's, and, and there should be no nature and no trees anymore. And you know, like, you know, the person just seems to be genuinely incensed by the idea of, and, and the developers making money. <laughs> and, like here's the main thing I noticed that people who own subdividable real estate don't seem to be any more interested in this stuff and in deregulation than anybody else. Right. And again, a lot of so, you know, like when someone has a piece of uh, like, like a, a, par, a plot of land where they could turn it into five homes and make a ton of money. I haven't seen any sign that they are more pro development than someone who just ha- who basically is just going to see their housing price fall. And if they don't sell out, then they won't 
then you know basically basically they'll be losing money. So yeah. the social science is, has a lot of nice angles to pursue where you know because there's always subgroups that will benefit, and you can look and compare them and see are they really different from other from other people that seem to be in their social circles. And my general answer is very rarely, actually. Well, it's good to know that people are stupid rather than evil. Yes, uh, yes. Or, yeah. or angle, impu- impulsive. I mean, again, so it's, again, I don't, it's not so much, even so much intelligence as just mm. there's a knee-jerk answer and people don't exercise self-control, which which as a deontologist, I say is blameworthy and they, they ought to get their act <laughs> together. But, <laughs> well, and, I, and, and, I think it's bad for a different reason. <laughs> so you've been, you've been really generous with your time and I've got to let you go. Uh, but one, one final question. Uh, in in the case against education, uh, you suggest that you think opera is objectively one of one of the best art forms in the world, which which strikes me as just insane. Because not only do I think it's <laughs> not only do I think it's not objectively good, I, I don't think it's subjectively good. So, do, 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 you, want, do you want to make the case for opera? Uh, sure. You know, in in general with art, I say there's a trade off between accessib- you know, between accessibility and and, and long term enjoyment. So you know, there, there's there's a lot there are a lot of songs that are immediately catchy, and yet after people listen to them a few times, they they lose their flavor, and often you'll even come to dislike a song that you once liked, right? And you know, so like opera is at the opposite end of this usually, right? Opera is at the end where a lot of people do not like it at first, and yet I say there there the, that especially out of people who are smart, people who put time into it are unusually likely to actually get enormous replay value out of it and be able to enjoy it many more times than they would be able to enjoy a popular song. Uh, right, and especially because there's usually so many more levels working where there you've got, there's, you know, there, there, there is the, there's the plot, there's the, there are themes, there, but again, the music is also just normally much more complicated, so it's not immediately pleasing to the ear for a lot of it. Uh, you know, like, you know, Wickard Faulkner, like a lot of people, like, like there's, there was a lie at the time saying it's not as bad as it sounds, and that's true, actually, <laughs> right? So, you know, it's the kind of thing where you put years of study into it. I, you know, I think you really do get to increase returns. Now, again, this is something where if you have never tried to put that kind of effort into something, then I would say, well, just try it for one thing and see whether it happens for you. So, I mean, like, uh, there, there are certain pieces that I'd be happy to say, like, these are things where I think that if you are someone that is capable of getting these increasing returns, then if you try it, if you just listen to this thing 30 times, you'll get it. And then what? And then I'll say, and when you get it, you will get a pleasure that is greater than the pleasure that you've gotten from the popular songs that you've enjoyed up to this point. And again, and, and again, like especially like if you take the integral of all of the aesthetic pleasure that you get over this time. So that 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 is the main case that I make for it. It's a very consequentialist answer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, so you know, maxim, maximize the the aesthetic enjoyment that you get out of it. So, yeah, sure. You know, so you know, there are some people that I would just say they would just never enjoy it, and then I wouldn't push it on them at all. You're someone where I think there actually is a good chance that if you put you know invested invested something into it, that you would get a lot out of it. Now, I wouldn't want you to go and start investing thousands of hours because maybe I'm wrong and maybe you wouldn't. But if you would, I mean, if you were to go and invest, say, you know, 50 hours over the next three years into into something like this. I, th- I think that would probably be, be well worth your time in terms of just the option value. I've got to preserve my self-image there, Brian. I've, I've carved out this niche as someone who <laughs> thinks that Nicki Minaj is the greatest art form that, that's possible. <laughs> but my guest today right. has been Brian Kaplan. Thanks for coming on the 80,000 Hours podcast, Brian. My pleasure to have you, and, or my pleasure to, uh, to be on it, rather. And let me just say, so you can get The Case Against Education for only 20 bucks on Amazon. So uh, it is packed full of useful advice, not only for effective altruists, but also for effective egoists. So if you are either of those or any combination of the two, you've got to buy this book. Right, Rob? Absolutely. Yeah, no. Absolutely. I, mean, yes. I, I read the whole thing. We also we didn't have time to discuss your previous books, but I stick up links to, to those as well. And I've read right. them both and, and very much enjoyed them. So people should right. go, go out and uh, you know give you a dollar with each copy that they buy. All right. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. You too. If you're enjoying the show please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps other people find out about us, and we're also looking for some quotes to put on our homepage, and we might grab some from there. The 80,000 Hours podcast is produced by Kieran Harris. Thanks for joining, and talk to you next week.